the dinosaur Dave gifted a tier 1 sub to Mav underscore K14.
this usually take? The shape bring an immediate return. Shoot the radar into the ground and the bone bounces the image back. Bounces it back. This new program's incredible. Mm. Two more years development and we won't even have to dig anymore. Where's the fun in that? It's a little distorted, but I don't think it's a computer. Oh. Post-mortem contraction of the posterior neck ligaments. Velociraptor? Yeah, it's good shape, too. It's five, six feet high. I'm guessing nine feet long. Look at the extra... What'd you do? He touched it. <laughs> Dr. Grant's not machine compatible. Oh, you got it in for me. <laughs> and look at the half-moon-shaped bones on the wrist. There's no one of these guys learn how to fly. That doesn't look very scary. More like a six-foot turkey. <laughs> turkey, huh? Turkey. Well, maybe dinosaurs have more in common with present-day birds than they do with reptiles. Look at the pubic bone, turned backward, just like a bird. Look at the vertebrae, full of air sacs and hollows, more just like, like a bird. More like a six-foot turkey. And <laughs> Turkey. Six foot turkey. Turkey. Six foot turkey. Okay. Try to imagine yourself in the Cretaceous period. Get your first look at this six foot turkey and see whether it's clear. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Paleontologizing. Happy Thursday to you. Happy Thursday, Birds Day to you. And also, happy National Serpent Day, everyone. I just learned about this the other day, but apparently today is National Serpent Day. So what a wonderful excuse to talk about snakes. Snakes get a bad rap, but they're really important animals super fascinating. They've got a really interesting fossil history, so they're a perfect topic for today here on Paleontologizing. If it's anybody's very first time here, then uh, let me introduce myself real quick. Um, my name is Danny Anduza, and I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. You probably know already that a paleontologist is a fossil scientist. That's me. I work on dinosaur fossils in particular. Most paleontologists don't really have anything to do with dinosaurs. They work on other groups of fossil organisms. But, I don't know, maybe I'm not helping that, uh, that stereotype. I do work on dinosaurs. I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, I dig up dinosaurs during the summer in places like Montana and Wyoming and Utah. This past summer we were lucky enough to actually be able to broadcast that live on Twitch, so check out the YouTube page if you want to see recordings of those live streams. 
digging up at least three new species of dinosaur last summer in Utah and Wyoming. But when I'm not out in the field, I'm here in my office in the San Francisco Bay Area talking to you about fossils, about natural history, about extinction and evolution, biodiversity, the history of life on our incredible planet Earth. So if you have questions about any of those topics, whether you're curious about natural selection or how we as paleontologists dig up fossils or how science works in general, if you've got questions more broadly about scientific method, the philosophy of science, all those topics are fair game here on Paleontologizing Q&A. Your questions and answers are the bread and butter of these streams, so please do not hesitate to ask those questions. That's what I'm here for, and that's what sets this medium, Twitch, this whole platform apart from stuff like YouTube, is that you can ask questions in real time and get answers in real time. That interactivity is part of what makes this really special, and that's part of what I really love about streaming here on Twitch. So I'm glad you're here. Before we get into National Serpent Day, and later Thursday Birds Day, and Metazoo before, uh, before that, let's do some greetings. Let's see who's here in chat, and let's say hello. And if you've got any questions uh, brewing right now, don't keep them in. Type them into the chat. I want to hear them. Uh, Matt M33 appears to have been first today. How you doing, Matt? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Also, I think we had Kodali and Dinosaur Dave above, too, and Claire Burr. How are you all doing? It's great to see you. And, uh, new dinosaur paper. Very cool, Dinosaur Dave. Thank you, thank you. Um. Oh, and this is interesting. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you, Dinosaur Dave. It's good to see you. Yeah. Uh, Blueberry Bean, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good to see you. The Mayor of Space, what's shaking with you, Mayor? It's always good to see you. I, uh, I hope you're having a good week. I hope you're having a good day. Appreciate you, Mayor of Space, and your mod work. Little Pink Pony says, I'm so excited. I love snakes. I even have a snake tattoo. Very cool, Little Pink Pony. Very, very cool. Well, you're going to like today's stream, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Parallax, oh, too, how are you doing? I dig those snake emotes. Verminitide, Doug, what's shaking with you? Um, Nalkar, how are you doing? Welcome back. It's good to see you. And Red Bulwark says, I am early, question mark? You're early enough, Red Bulwark. In fact, you're right on time. It's good to have you here. Yeah. Uh, and Tommy Plotticus, pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to have you, Tommy Plotticus. Cliff Alistair McLean. Uh, a gaming stream. I haven't played Snake since MS-DOS 4.0. We could play some Snake game. Is that is that on the list of, of Twitch games? Snake? I used to play that on my dad's cell phone. He had this old blue Nokia phone. Like a brick phone. And, uh... Yeah. I don't know. He used to let me play Snake on it sometimes. It was, it was pretty cool. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Holy moly. Good game, Snake. One of the best games of all time, if you ask me. You shouldn't ask me. I don't know anything about video games. Um, Sweet Sauerkraut, welcome back. It's good to see you. Not the brain. Hello, hello. That Texas Cryptid, what's shaking with you? It's Evolution. Has come to join us. How are you doing, It's Evolution? Cast the Dreamer says Tradoon, and Tradoon to you too, Cast the Dreamer. Howdy, howdy, sandwich, nom nom. Welcome, welcome. Portugask, I feel like it's been a while. How are you doing, Portugask? Hello, hello. Tiny Boss Ginger, thank you for being here as well. What kind of unholy amalgam is that? Part Stegosaur, part Diplodocid, part Baryonyx? Oh boy. Yeah. Um. Let's see. And thank you, Dinosaur Dave. I appreciate you posting the link to uh, to that paper. Good stuff. Phoenix the Archaeologist is back as well. Bone Squad to you too, Phoenix. Howdy. Howdy. Grim Deviant. How are you doing? Welcome back. Um, Cyan Streams. How are you doing, Valent? It's good to see you. I had a lot of fun streaming with you last night. I can only wish we had another dozen hours to do that. Holy cow, it's always fun. 
talking science with you, Balance. Um, appreciate you. I appreciate your ongoing support. It's good to see you. Optic Nerve, how are you doing? Hello, hello. It's good to see you again, Optic Nerve. Uh, Ren in Doubt is here just in time for Thursday Bird's Day. We're talking about snakes first, though. Little Pink Pony says we should talk about Jacobson's organ. Uh, we could if you'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Hugin, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Does this mean we get Frog Friday? Tomorrow is actually... We're going to be talking about rodents tomorrow, Hugin. We're going to be talking about rodents. Because you know what tomorrow is. Yeah... And, uh... I think you should enjoy science as much as you can. And you can't enjoy science alone. You have to share it. It's true. Jaded Fairy, thank you for sharing science with all of us. For your support with that prime. I appreciate it, Jaded Fairy. I really do. Thank you, thank you. Uh... Uh, Pimpcat, what's shaking with you? Beards, it's good to see you. Steely Dan, Constrictor Comrades, Ask Allies... Python Pals. I like it, Steely Dan. And Sculpin. Thank you for those 100 bits. I appreciate that, too. I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Neil is here as well. Welcome, welcome, Neil. Golganek. How are you doing, Golganek? Always a joy to see you in my chat. I know I say that a lot, but it's wonderful having you here, Golganek. Thanks for spending time with us. Um, let's see. Space Frog. Howdy, howdy. I hope you're having a good day so far. It's good to see you. Uh, scrolling, scrolling. Green Herring, thank you for the resubscribe there. How many months is that, Green Herring? Eleven of them. Wowza, wowza, Green Herring. Wowza. Good stuff. Um, all right, scrolling, scrolling. Pandarius has returned as well. How are you doing, Pandarius? Uh, Pandarius. Pandarius. I'm You're glad you returned. Cheated, try Welcome. blaming the dinosaurs. Trin? And Golganek, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome, Golganek. 100 bits, thank you for, for that support, Golganek. Trying to get a hype train kicked off here. It looks like it might have worked. Do we have success? We do. 35% of the way to a level 1 hype train. Beautiful. Gotta love it. Um, not the brain. Did I say hello to you yet? Not the brain. What about you, Murph? Howdy, howdy, Murph. I hope you're having a good day. It's good to see you, as always. And Squiggles de Gabo. What a fun name to say. Squiggles de Gabo says, That one kid got chased by a turkey down a farm road. Oh, he never got chased by a turkey down a farm road. Yeah. Oh, boy. Too bad, too. He ended up being eaten by a dromaeosaur as a result. You know? Ironheart. No, Sculpin. Then Ironheart. Sculpin. Thank you. Thank you, Sculpin, for those five gift subs there. I and the five folks who just got a gift sub are very appreciative. Thank you for supporting science. As tall as a two-story building, he could kill almost anything that crossed his path. Just like Ironheart 50. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Balio Science Shake, Balio Science Shake, Balio Science Shake. Thank you for the 43 shake. months of support. Holy cow, Ironheart. Holy cow. That's extraordinary. And I think that's probably the first time that new alert has been triggered. That very old new alert. Yeah. Gotta love those 1960s, 1970s dinosaur documentaries. So out of date. Charmingly obsolete. Anyway, Ironheart, thank you for helping me not become obsolete through your continued support. It means a lot. It really does. I am Morvash. How are you doing? Welcome. Welcome. It's good to have you here. Um, scrolling, scrolling. Henrida says, oh, how are you doing, Henrida? Howdy. And, uh, Bella Messina says, hi, all. Mostly lurking here, but wanted to say hello. Well, thank you, Bella. Welcome to Paleontologizer. It is Good to have you here. Thanks for uh, for chiming in and announcing yourself. We appreciate your lurking and also your saying hi. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Uh, and Steely Dan says, I love animals that can sense things like that we can't, like pit vipers seeing in infrared. Isn't that cool, Steely Dan? Uh, and Trappy Jenkins says, that's a great color on you, Danny. I appreciate that, Trappy. I appreciate that. 
I might have to get another one of these shirts. I like this a lot. Uh, this is fairly new. But yeah, thank you, Trappy. It's good to see you. Uh, uh, and Arg, I got sucked into Twitch. Welcome back, Arg. Good to see you. Mary L63, howdy, howdy. Chris TS, what's shaking with you? It's good to see you here. Uh, Evane7375, hello to you too. Hope you're having a good day so far. Uh, playing Snake on a Nokia, good times. Yeah, Green Herring. Uh, good times indeed. Yeah. And uh, let's see. Little Pink Pony says, I've had pet snakes since I was very young. I'm not sure why my parents let me get pet snakes when I was like four, but that's what I wanted. That's actually really cool. I've always kind of wanted a pet snake, never had one. Little Pink Pony. Yeah, and snake is a category on Twitch. Well, 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 Claire Burr. Uh, it's a very costly business nowadays to articulate a dinosaur. God smile. Thank you, thank you, Delta, for those 500 bits. I appreciate that, Delta. How are you doing? Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday, Bird's Day, and happy National Serpent Day to you, Delta. What are we talking about? Those wonderful legless lizards today. Um, yeah, yeah, here, let me continue to scroll down here. Um, let's see. And... Jaded Fairy says, I love this channel so much. I just think it's so wonderful to see education like this here. And I want to see more. Oh, man. I'm trying to, you know, to bring new people and, and encourage other people who are doing science education here on Twitch. Just the other day, actually, we had, or other week, I guess, we had a brand new streamer here doing science. Can we get a shout out for her? Astro Alexandra. Let me try and do this shout out. Because um, I think... I think there's an, an underscore in there. There we go. Yeah. She apparently does a lot of stuff on TikTok, and she's got like 3 billion followers on there. But she just recently came onto Twitch as well, and that's wonderful. We need more people doing science here on Twitch, so I'm all for it. Go give her a follow if that sounds interesting to you. Um, yeah, yeah. And... Little Pink Pony says, no, legless lizards are different. Yes and no, Little Pink Pony, yes and no. So, snakes, true snakes, did evolve from lizards, so they are legless lizards, even if they're not legless lizards. Does that make sense? Leglessness has actually evolved in lizards about a dozen times. We'll be talking about that today, too. Um, but yeah, yeah. Snakes are just the first and most successful time that that happened, as far as we know. So yeah, yeah. Uh, and Delta has replied. Delta said, I'm getting ready to have breakfast. Happy Serpent Day to you as well. Where are you right now, just having breakfast now, Delta Rain? <laughs> you know, maybe down in Australia or something? It's good to see you, Delta. Uh, and uh, Delta Rain says, do they have vestigial feed bones? Uh, one kind of snake kinda does. Anacondas, just the male ones, I think, of these little spurs. Pelvic spurs that are remnants of their pelvic girdle. Um... But snakes completely lost their limbs a long time ago. They'll be looking at some fossils today of some snakes that still had limbs. Like this one right here. I think this is Diablo Diablophus right here. Yeah, pretty cool critter. And look at those little limbs right there. This is, of course, from the Cretaceous period. So that theropod skull there is a fresh one. Um, yeah, yeah. And Anakin Gabriel says, how old are snakes? Uh, I could make a joke and go, well, it depends on when they were born. But no, instead, snakes, um, they seem to show up in like the early Cretaceous period. So they're not as old as birds are, actually. Birds predate snakes. I remember saying that to somebody once, and they're like, no, that can't be true. I'm like, what, what do you mean it can't be true? And they go, well, snakes just seem so prehistoric. You know, birds don't seem like that. 
well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Birds evolved in like the the late to maybe middle Jurassic. Snakes evolved in the early Cretaceous, so snakes are like what, like 40 million years younger than birds, something like that. Yeah. Anywho, we'll be talking about that today. Yeah. Nature being counterintuitive. Yes, indeed, Delta Rain. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, uh... Red Bullrick says, can you do a rough overview of the period sometime? Oh, you could do it. I could do that right now. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, I should find you, like, a decent video on the subject, but for right now, we'll, I'll just take you straight to the... We'll get it straight from the science horse's mouth, you know? So this is what we call... The International Chrono Stratigraphic Chart. There's a link to it right there in the chat. And so this is... You know, a record of time here on our planet. We're here at the very top. Uh... In the Cenozoic era, the Age of Mammals, as it's often called. Even though bird species outnumber mammal species like two to one. You could still, you could call it the Age of Birds if you wanted to. But, uh, anyway. Um, snakes evolved here during the Mesozoic era, during the Age of the Dinosaurs. So, Mesozoic era. And within an era, you have different time periods. So it goes eon, era, period... Epoch, and then age or stage. So within the Mesozoic era, the age of the dinosaurs, you've got the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods. The asteroid hits at the end of the Cretaceous, brings the age of the dinosaurs to a close, except for birds. Um, snakes, we think, evolved somewhere in like the Aptian or Albion, I think, in the lower Cretaceous. About a hundred to a hundred and twenty million years ago, something like that. Whereas birds evolved in either the lower part of the upper Jurassic or maybe the middle Jurassic. So about roughly a hundred and sixty million years ago. So birds are roughly forty million years older than snakes are as a group. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oh, and pythons and boas also have pelvic spurs? I didn't know that, Claire. That's really cool. Neat, neat, neat. Yeah, and Henrita says, I didn't know that there were levels to the time words. I thought they were synonyms. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, eon, era, period, epoch, and stage. Um, yeah, yeah. So this is kind of like Paleontology 101 right here. But let's see if... We can find like a short explanatory video on that before we get into uh, National Serpent Day. Yeah. Um. Let's try this. What in the world? When? Why? Where? Who? Huh. This is delightful. Next to some mountains that are millions of years old, and the Earth is itself four and a half billion years old. How do I even wrap my mind around that length of time? That's a good question. Good question. Hmm. How can you imagine 4.5 billion years? And how does that compare to the amount of time that humans have been around? A geologist gave us the idea to use a football field as a metaphor, and that's ah uh, and. Well, there's, there's also a clip of this here. Let me find that real quick, but in uh, Bill Nye's dinosaur episode, he had a... Uh, he used the same analogy. Let me see if I can find that. Here it is. For what has to be... Got it? Yeah, all right. Dinosaurs and humans never Remember, dinosaurs and humans never lived at the same time. Got it? 
Yeah. Excalibur right. Source Rex, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Good evening, sports fans. Timmy Tucker here with Lance Yardstick for what has to be the biggest game of all time: the terrestrial surface dwellers versus the march of time and this is the hmm. one we've all been waiting for that's right timmy what we're about to witness is the culmination of 4.6 billion years of preparation and there's the start of the game and the march of time is kicking off and odd simpson catches the ball on the zero yard line you know timmy if the history of the earth were laid out on a football field like a timeline the zero yard line would be when earth began about 4.6 billion years ago. That's right, Lance, a very long time ago indeed. And Simpson is breaking the ball down to the 20-yard line now. The 20-yard line, that would be when primitive life forms began appearing on Earth about mm. three and a half billion years ago. All right, you following? Crosses the 50 now. 45, 40, 35, 30. He's getting close now. 25. He's on the 20-yard line. By the way, the 20-yard line, that would be when land plants and fish appeared on the Earth. About yep. So that's that's pretty far into the whole thing, like plants and fish, plants on land at least, and fish uh, in the seas. 425 million years ago, that's like, you know, pretty close to uh, zero, lar zero yard line. Five million years ago, Simpson is now drawing a crowd at the 10 yard line. That, uh, that's only 225 million years First dinosaurs. About when the dinosaurs... Yeah, a little bit after the first dinosaurs. Now, the eight, the seven, 65 million years ago, more or less when the dinosaurs became extinct. Five, yep, 66. Four, three, two, that's the fumble! Wait a minute, wait a minute, what happened on there? Was it a touchdown or <laughs> this not? is clever here, actually. The officials are measuring now. Let's take a closer look now with the magnet. Measuring. Game. It looks like that fumble occurred within the one yard line, actually about the three quarter inch line or the two centimeter line. That's when human beings finally showed up on the planet only about there a you million go. years ago. Not really very <laughs> long ago in Earth's history, Lance. Now, wait a minute. They say they need an even closer measurement now. So let's go down and look at this with the micro cam. That looks to be about half a thousandth of an inch or 13 micrometers or one tissue paper's width from the goal line. And on the other side of that piece of tissue paper, an almost unmeasurable distance, two-thirds of one micrometer. That's where Bill Nye was born. Who's Bill Nye? Yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, it's been done before. Now we know how old paleontologizing is. Yeah, there you go. Uh, MavK14, welcome, welcome. And John Pabonis says 4.6 billion years. That's how long my my works told me my pay rise. Did you gotta wait that long for a raise, John Pabonis? Oh boy. Yeah. Measuring. Yeah, that might be like an accent that's now more or less extinct in airspace. It almost reminds me of like a like a transatlantic accent or something. Yeah, it's broadcaster stuff. You can probably go to school for that. Years. How does that compare to the amount of time that humans in 4.5 billion years? How does yeah. that compare to the amount of time that humans have been around? A geologist gave us the idea to use a football field as a metaphor, and that's exactly what we're going to do. At this end zone, we've got the present. And at this end zone is the moment our planet formed. Earth's entire history stretches the full hundred yards in between. This is cool. Every inch is 1.3 million years. Let's start at the beginning and take a walk through Earth's entire history. For the first few hundred million years, the Earth was bombarded by rocks from outer space. But now <laughs> it's starting to calm down. And way up here, 3.8 billion years ago, life begins. Yep. We're talking simple life. Single cells floating in a vast ocean. This is great. Cells Holy cow. Out new ways to get energy. They're evolving to harness the power of the sun. Photosynthesis starts past the 20 yard line. The air here is mostly carbon dioxide and nitrogen. 
But right around here, little green cells start making yep. oxygen. The great oxygenation here, event. About 2.3 billion years ago, oxygen starts building up in the atmosphere. Yeah. We're halfway down the field, and we just got the kind of atmosphere that humans can breathe. For the next billion and a half years, it's paradise for single cells of every variety. But as we move down the field, cells start working together. Yeah. By the time we reach the 18 yard line right here, there's lots of complex critters floating around. It's 800 million years before the present, and things are about to get really interesting. Here at the 13 yard line, we've got an ozone layer. Nice. Here, That's important. Explosion of diversity. Fungi. Yeah. Mollusks. 530 million years ago, animals take their first steps on land. In the ocean, fish appear. Land plants, insects, sharks, amphibians. It's been 4 billion years since we started, and here at the 5 yard line, we're just starting to see the first mammals and dinosaurs. Yeah. Stegosaurus dinosaurs right here, about 176 hey, can million I just get years ago. Hey, living dinosaur? Um... Nyokuru, thank you for the follow, and welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, uh, we will be talking about non-Mesozoic snakes today, too, Nell. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, did he say Stegosaurus 176 million years ago? Stegosaurus as a group, sure, but Stegosaurus is a Stegosaur from the late Jurassic. It's from about 155 million years ago. About 20 million years off there. Stegosaurus dinosaurs right here about 176 million years ago. Stegosauria, yes, but not Stegosaurus proper. Until about four and a half feet from the end zone about 68 million years ago. Look, yeah. the T-Rex is closer to us in the present than it is to the Stegosaurus way back there. Yeah. Whoa, and there's a catastrophe at the one yard line. 66 million years ago, a meteor or volcanoes or climate change or all... Asteroid killed 75% of all species. But life rallies. This yard is the yard of mammals. We've got armadillos, giant whales, wolves, and here a foot away, the great apes, our family. <laughs> Hippos, mammoths, lions, Lucy, almost human, but not quite, saber-toothed tigers, cattle, <laughs> Then 200,000 years ago, this is where we find humans that look like us. That's just an eighth of an inch from the end zone, the width of this light bulb. This is all of human experience, but everything we call civilization, agriculture, cities, books, science, these don't appear until we're two <laughs> Twitch .TV. from the end zone. <laughs> the width of this filament. Pretty cool, right? And I love that. That is super, super cool. What a great representation of the history of life on Earth. Oregon State Bears for letting us do all this weird stuff on their football field. And to you, we yeah, say... I mean, you're using it for something more important than they are. Here's a uh, here's a link to that video. Good stuff. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Very cool, very cool. Great video, right, Anakin? Yeah. Um. And keep it. We can trigger it, but turn off the auto. Yeah, let's turn off the auto post there, Claire Bear. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good idea. Uh, but yeah, yeah. And you always prefer the 24-hour model. There's also the the year model, and it's a bunch of different ways to think about the history of life on Earth. But I hope that made sense, and I hope you've got a better understanding of that kind of thing now. And if you want an interactive time chart here, where you can look at all of these, look at the Cretaceous. the Maastrichtian stage of the Cretaceous, etc., stuff like that, then here is this link for you also. Uh, neat stuff, right? Anyway, today is National Serpent Day. So let's talk about that. I'm, uh... Not totally sure what National Serpent Day is. I had to make sure it wasn't some sort of... I don't know, it wasn't anything a suspect. And it looks like it's not, so, uh... Well, let's talk about it.
<laughs> National Serpent Day. Here we go. Welcome to February 1st on the National Day calendar. President Theodore Roosevelt was a lover of the natural world. When he visited Arizona in 1913, he made it a point to visit the Hopi Indian tribe in order to witness their sacred snake dance, something uh. outsiders rarely get to see. This ceremony, which has been performed for centuries, is the tribe's way of showing respect to nature in the hope of receiving ample rainfall in the coming season. The huh. event involves gathering snakes, both venomous and non-venomous, and bathing them before they are draped over the dancers. Roosevelt was awed by the ceremony, and as tough as he was, he was taken aback by the sight. On huh. National Serpent Day, we celebrate these reptiles who often get a bad rap. Although they do. Although we strongly recommend viewing them at a safe distance. I'm yep. Carlo Anderson with the National Day Calendar. See you again tomorrow as we celebrate every day. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. I did not, I was not aware of that. Uh, National Serpent Day. Didn't know it had anything to do with, with Roosevelt. Did he declare National Serpent Day? Shoot. Let's look that up real quick. National Serpent Day. What? Okay, we don't actually have a... A Wikipedia article on it? Who actually sanctioned this? Um, okay, this might not be one of those things that's actually, like, real in any meaningful sense. But that's okay. We can still celebrate snakes. And it is... <laughs> Another greeting card company holiday, exactly, Will 6 too. You know, just another excuse to go out and buy your partner a bunch of plastic snakes, you know? The holiday industrial complex strikes again. Uh, and 16th of July is World Snake Day. Well, I'm going to be in the field for World Snake Day, um, along with a bunch of other cool national days and noteworthy events, so by... Yeah. So we're taking advantage of this today while we can a mayor of space said, maybe this is kind of like Whacking Day. Well... I don't think it is, but for those of you who are not familiar with Whacking Day... Um... Let me introduce you to it. Tonight on Eye on Springfield, the Munchkins! With oh. oh! And Lordy, holy cow! Well, 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 Lordy. Lordy and their 13 raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Lordy, thank you, thank you for the raid. How did your stream go? I hope it was really good. And I'm glad you're feeling well enough to stream. Holy cow. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Lordy is a member of my stream team and a member of my household. I moved in with Lordy and Ios back in December. And, uh... Lordy's got COVID right now. She's on the mend. Seems to be doing a little bit better. Um, but yeah, thanks for the warm welcome. You bet, Lordy. Thank you, thank you. How did your painting go? I heard you were doing some watercolors, right? Maybe making some uh, vellum times? I hope that went well. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's good to have you here, Lordy. And happy National Serpent Day to you. This is kind of the opposite. Uh, nine Valentines. Very nice, Lordy. Very, very nice. Yeah. Tried to don't have COVID anymore? I did try, Mayor of Space. And look. I succeeded. Check that out. Yeah. Negativo. No, I... Un COVID. Yeah. So yeah. I'm still negative, which is good. Guess those boosters are working. Um. Anyway. 
National Serpent Day. It, apparently, it's not really a super real thing, but, uh, I don't know. We can think of it as kind of the spiritual opposite of Whacking Day. Tonight on Eye on Springfield, the Munchkins from the Wizard of Oz. Where are they now? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Distasteful and puerile by a panel of hillbillies. Whacking day! Oh no, no! In a mm. tradition that dates back to founding father Jebediah Springfield, every May 10th, local residents gather to drive snakes into the center of town and whack them to snake heaven. <laughs> After exposing Alger Hiss, Honorary Grand Marshal Richard Nixon goes after another deadly hiss. <laughs> Is whacking day over? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Uh, so barbaric. Hey, kids. How was school? I learned how many drams in a penny weight. I got expelled. That's my boy. Hmm. Here. What? You're going to get an education. Yeah. I'm going to teach you myself. Marge, it's too. Anyway, um. Yeah, yeah. Whacking day. Lisa's not happy about it. You know, it's it's easy to relate to Lisa, especially you know as a as a you know young aspiring scientist. If there's one character in the show that, even if she is a bit of a scold, um, it's easy to relate to. It's it's Lisa for sure. And the Lord said, Whack ye all the serpents which crawl on their bellies, and thy town shall be a beacon unto others. So you see, Lisa, even God himself endorses whacking day. Let me see that. <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get this part, skip this part. Uh... Yeah. A giant foam cowboy hat and air horn. If the snakes were in here, we could protect them. Well, according to this, snakes hear by sensing vibrations in the ground. This is true. Snakes don't actually have external ears. It's one of the ways you can tell the difference between a true snake and a legless lizard. Like a glass lizard or a slow worm or something like that. Uh, snakes actually hear through sensing vibrations on the ground through their lower jawbone. If we put yeah. our stereo speakers on the ground and play something with a lot of bass, eyelids too. Yeah, they're snakes clever. Yeah. Snakes will be in here like Oprah and a big ham. Oh, good idea. Let's see. Bass, bass. Tiny Tim, the chipmunk's greatest hit, a castrato Christmas. Ah. Oh. Can't get enough of your <laughs> love, babe. Anyway, so they recruit Barry White to uh to sing and uh, uh yeah yeah uh, well, I don't know why Lisa's playing bass she's never done that before or since but whatever my darling I can't get enough of your love babe yeah girl I don't know I don't know why can't get enough of your love babe I much prefer singing to snakes than, you know, Something trying to murder them. To, no matter how yeah, it can be that much different for sex. I mean, they, they've got stuff with your fingers. Like the more you, give, you need a strap for it, you know? And baby, that's yeah, no, same thing. That's no lie. <laughs> Tell me, what can I say? What am I gonna do? How should I feel? <laughs> Where'd all the snakes go? People of Springfield. So here's the rant I was. Is a sham. It was started in. So yeah, yeah. Snakes deserve our respect and our understanding and our distance, oftentimes. Um. So I appreciate this. People of Springfield. Wacking. <laughs> there you go, rusty guy. Yeah. <laughs> Twenty-four is an excuse to beat up the Irish. Oh, it's true. I took many a lump. That was all in good fun. <laughs> Maybe vaguely offensive. It was 1994, you know. So, 
Yeah, yeah. Anyway, National Serpent Day might not be really any more real than, uh, than Whacking Day, but it doesn't mean we can't celebrate snakes on this very special day. Here's some objects, gorgeous gargantuans and authentic. Jump, Jess. Although they died out so long ago, their fossil bones remain, so we know just what they were like and can even sculpt them into still, or rather, extinct life. Thank you for the 17 months, and thank you for helping keep me extant through that support. I really appreciate it, Jeff Jess. I really, really do. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. So let's celebrate snakes on this very special National Serpent Day. Let's talk a little bit about them. Our slithery friends here. Um, look at these beautiful garter snakes. Lovely. And this is very, very true. Holy cow, I caught a snake um, back when I... So I used to teach outdoor education in uh, in the San Francisco Presidio. Uh, here, the beautiful San Francisco Presidio. This is a, it's actually a national park that's within the city boundaries of San Francisco. It used to be an army base years ago. And uh, nowadays, it's it's partly like a little bit of wilderness there in the city. It's, oh man, it's one of those beautiful places on Earth, honestly, in my opinion. Um, and there's woods and sand dunes and forests and marshes and lakes and ponds and, and meadows. And it's just, it's magical. The Presidio really is a gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous place. It's like, I think it's like four times the size of New York Central Park. Um, but anyway, there's a good number of, uh, of snakes there, too. Including a bunch of garter snakes. And, uh, let's see, where's the woods where I used to hang out? With all the kiddos. Um, Mountain Lake Park. Yeah, kind of near, like, Inspiration Point in that area. Anyway, good stuff. The Presidio. I don't know if I actually have any photos of this particular snake because it was getting kind of stressed out and I wanted to let it go before I could ask somebody to take a picture. But I found a snake and I'm like, who wants to come see the snake to all the kids? And then this is like during pickup time. So some of the parents were coming to pick up their kids right then also. And every single one of the kids ran over and like, I want to hold the snake. I want to hold the snake. Let me see the snake. The snake's so cool. And then one girl, she ran over and she was really excited to hold the snake and her mom walked up and she's like, oh, why are you holding that snake? And like the girl started to get scared after that because it's like, well, mom is scared of the snake. I should be scared of the snake too. So much of this kind of thing is just learned behavior from adults. It's almost like, well, learning almost doesn't, learning is almost too lofty a term for it. It's like, 
honestly, it's it's like inheriting prejudice from your parents in a sense. Um, because kids don't have any like inborn fear of snakes for the most part. That's something that like adults teach them, and it's really unfortunate, you know. Yeah, don't scrape your fears off on your kids. Exactly, Lenina. Yeah, yeah. Same with bugs and spiders. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and Will six two. You're right about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Anyway. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So that's it's interesting. That's what this reminded me of right here. Um. Oop. Let's go to this. Yeah. See? Very cool. Any any Manitobans in chat right now? Um, let me know. You may have actually seen this celebrated on the side of a U-Haul truck. This particular one right here. Come on. Uh, we need a bigger one than that, please. Yeah, there we go. Did you know what drives 150,000 red-sided garter snakes, one of the world's largest concentrations of vertebrate species, to join mating and feeding rituals in striking spectacle? Learn more about snake dens at their website. But yeah, Manitoba. Reptile ritual. Gotta love it. I love it when, like, a little bit of... Uh, I don't know, some... This, to me, is, like, unusual and heartwarming. But, like, you've got this very corporate thing, like U-Haul, but clearly there was somebody there who was very passionate about the natural world. Uh, who managed to get permission to, like, put stuff like this on the side of U-Haul trucks and vans. You know? Um... And there's some dinosaur ones, too. Well, there's a sturgeon right there. For Virginia. There's a... Big old spider. There in Hawaii. Uh, there's a Dilophosaurus as well. There we go, yeah, for the state of Connecticut. Normally you don't kind of see this stuff in, like, a corporate context like this, you know? But yeah, yeah. It's, uh... It's cool stuff. But anyway. Um, these are indeed garter snakes. And that is what's being shown here. The inner lake of Manitoba is so plentiful, or why snakes are so plentiful here, really goes back to the geology of the area. Huh. Temp oh, boy. Very cool. Brumation, yeah, there you go, Alexander Morrison, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pennsylvania too? That's cool, Will. I didn't know that.
<laughs> it's presumably larger than a male on average. Wow. Interesting. Snakefall. <laughs> there you go, Claire Burr. That sounds like a 007 film title. Snakefall. Ambassadors of the reptile world. They're a great yeah, way for people. They do have teeth, but they don't have fangs in, like, a viper sense. Yeah. That's super cool. And now, it would make sense if the females were larger than the males. On average, yeah. Yeah. Cool stuff. Cool stuff. They can bite in well. It's true, Will. Yeah. They're not venomous, though. So garter snakes are... Uh, are definitely not venomous. Um, but the, really, the thing you gotta worry about more maybe than being bitten is, um... Yeah... That they will... They'll, like, kind of spray you? Uh, with this smelly liquid. When they're distressed, they, uh, they excrete this smelly liquid to try and turn you off and make you go away. Yeah. Here, here's a little video about garter snakes here. Garter snakes are some of the most well-known snakes in North America. And for yeah. good reason. These noodle boys are found from Canada to Central America and are often the most populous snakes in any given habitat. Garter snakes live in, well, basically every environment. They can be found in hmm. grasslands, forests, swamps, coastal areas, mountainous areas, even urban settings. Though, yep. like most of us, they have their favorite places. While Chester prefers the warmest spot on the pillow at night, also known as directly on my head, garter snakes generally like wet environments. Stream sides, lake sides, river sides, all these places can attract a garter snake and make her feel right at home. These snakes yeah. aren't great climbers, so they spend most of their time on the ground. Sometimes they can be found hanging out in low-lying bushes, but it's unlikely someone will get smacked by one falling from the tree canopy. Their territories are often quite small, so while they're generally considered solitary snakes for most of the year... At first is a garter snake? Very cool, not the brain? Nice. It's not unlikely there are plenty of gar And Tommy Plodicus! Tommy Plodicus gifted a tier 1 sub to Slithery Little Sneaky Snake. They have given 41 gift subs in the channel. Well, 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 that is an... Excellent target for that gift sub, Tommy Plodicus. Thank you for your generosity and your support. Is Slithery Little Sneaky Snack here or elsewhere? That gift sub might bring them right in here. Thank you, Tommy Plodicus. Garter snake individuals living in close uh. proximity. When different species inhabit a similar area, they may even separate themselves Robotic from the moisture titanic. of the oh, I habitat, think I did see that, Hugan, yeah. one species preferring the wetter areas, and the other preferring the drier areas. It all depends on the species, of which hmm. there are currently thought to be more than 30, though this could always change with new research. Garter snakes are most active during the day, except for the hottest parts of the summer. During these times, garter snakes will either switch their activity times to night, or they'll just become sluggish and not really do anything, though their parents aren't breathing down their throats to get a summer job. Actually, their parents probably aren't talking to them at all. Garter snakes are on their own from birth. In northern parts of their range, garter snakes may gather in large groups and hibernate together during the winter. This is similar to the rattlesnakes we've talked about previously. When they emerge in spring, they mate. 
Hey, it's way easier to find a mate that way. Everybody's like right there. Perhaps you've seen the garter snake <laughs> on U-Haul trucks. There you go. The yeah. Manitoba. This is what those trucks are referring to. Nice. Female garter snakes won't lay eggs. They retain the eggs inside their bodies and then give birth to live young sometime in the late summer. The Ooh, so that strategy, when you still have eggs, but the eggs and the eggs have shells, but they hatch inside your body and then the then the babies come out hatched, that's called not ovipary, not egg laying, not vivipary, giving live birth. It's ovovivipary. Kind of splits the difference there. And uh, it, it it may actually be how vivipary evolved in uh, in a bunch of different lineages of critters. as That's kind of the intermediate stage between laying eggs and giving live birth. You just keep the eggs inside you until they hatch and then the babies come out. So yeah. So this can vary by species. The babies are most vulnerable in their first year of life. Not only do they have to watch out for predators like fish, frogs, other snakes, crows, hawks, herons, and foxes. They have to eat enough food to ensure they can survive the winter hibernation, at mm. least in northern living species. Species found in the southern parts of their range may not hibernate through the winter. Garter snakes eat all kinds of food. Some are specialists and only eat certain types of food, but others will eat anything from leeches to birds to bats. As we discussed in our rear fanged snake episode, garter snakes may have a mild toxin to paralyze their prey. I was eating a frog? Yeah, was it? Actually, cause mild reactions in humans. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on, hang on. What? What did she say? Garter snakes may have a mild toxin to paralyze their prey. They might have a mild tox. Even if they're not venomous, they might have a mild toxin. That's the first I've ever heard of this. Very interesting. While this has been shown to potentially cause mild reactions huh. in humans, garter snakes are still considered harmless. To uh, Mr. Knight, welcome back. Garter Good to have you here. Garter snakes are usually easy to identify. Many species yeah. have lateral stripes along their bodies, and they also come with keeled scales, like bush vipers. However, hmm. just because they can be easy to identify, they're often not easy to spot because their patterns help them blend in with their surroundings. If a garter Look how snake fast is they can swim predator, too! Holy cow! It's able to release poo and stinky musk, which will yep. cover both the snake and the predator. And who really wants to eat a poopy snake? For more yeah. facts on garter snakes, check out the links in the description. Interesting stuff. Here is a link to this video right here. Yeah, you do not. I don't eat it, Tommy Platicus. But that's an easy decision. I'm, you know, I don't really eat meat at all, so. <laughs> um, while we're talking about garter snakes, let me find you a really cool book right here. Um, after I... Oh, goodness, this camera. There we go. Now it's working. But there's an excellent book that I have here on my bookshelf uh, that I'd like to recommend to you, especially if you happen to live in North America. Raccoon Next Door is honestly one of my all-time favorite books. It's local here to the Bay Area. Of course, I happen to be from the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. This is where I was born and raised, where I live today. Um, and this book right here was written by a wildlife uh, columnist and former director of the Lindsay Wildlife Museum, which is like a public outreach facility and a wildlife hospital. They rehabilitate wild animals. If there's a, an injured animal, they'll take them in and... and uh... well, Yeah, shoot, let me show you a video. I guess now they're the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. Um, here we go. But 
I grew up coming here when I was a kid. It really is kind of a magical place. And there's a king snake? Or a rat snake? I think it's a king snake there. Yeah. Oh. And who is that? A nut hatch or something? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Anyway, that's the Lindsay Wildlife Experience. Previously, the, when I was a kid, it was the Lindsay Wildlife Museum. But uh, this guy here, Gary Bogue, used to be, I think, director of the Lindsay Wildlife Museum. So he was really well-versed in wildlife rehabilitation and everything. <clears throat> this is a really, really excellent book that he wrote. Kind of chronicling his... Well, just talking about different kinds of, of wildlife that people would encounter. The point of this book is, like, you keep this on your shelf, and you can read read it cover to cover if, you know, if you feel like it, but also it's kind of a reference guide. So, like, you can go through different groups of animals, and, uh, and if you happen to encounter any of these creatures, Reptiles, page 93, it kind of gives you advice on how to deal with them. In a way that's good for you, in a way that's good for them as well. So the coast garter snake. There we go. Garter snakes are usually found near streams and ponds, so look for them in similar spots in your yard. They feed on slugs, they find under your garden vegetables, tree frogs, and the mosquito fish in your backyard ornamental pond, and tiny mice where they can find them. Leave them alone, put down that hoe, and they'll help you control the creatures that nibble on your garden plants. So there's all kinds of of Really, really excellent advice in this book about getting along with the different creatures that share our urban, suburban, and exurban environments with us. I thought there would be more about garter snakes, but I guess there isn't. Um, anyway, yeah. Excellent book. And I was lucky enough to actually nab a copy of this that's signed by both the author and the artist. So... Pretty cool. When uh, when Ios and Lordy first got this house, uh, as like new homeowners, I got them this book as like a housewarming gift. Because there's a backyard here. And there's like critters that'll show up eventually, or inevitably, you know? This is a good book to have uh, if you have a backyard or a garage or like, I don't know. If there's any chance that wildlife might show up in your vicinity, this is an excellent book to have. I highly recommend it. Um, but yeah, that's for the lock code for your bit. There you go, Nell, yeah. <laughs> uh, and Will62 says, Garter snakes will basically not go further than one mile from a flowing water source. That makes sense. Yeah. They like water. They like water. And SB says, is it specific for the West Coast? It's written from the perspective of an author who, uh, you know, he ran the Lindsay Wildlife Museum at the time. He was also a columnist, like a wildlife columnist for the Contra Costa Times. So people would write in all the time with different questions about different animals and he'd give them advice. It was basically like the newspaper equivalent to like car talk, if you're familiar with car talk, except about animals. Um, it was great. Yeah. But the thing is, many of the creatures that we have here on the West Coast, you have throughout the rest of the country. And much of this advice is going to be the same for similar species throughout the rest of North America, and honestly, on different continents as well. So yeah, so he wouldn't know much about gators. He would know a thing or two about gators, Trusa Sap, but... Um, I don't know. It's, 
it's just a delightful book, and I think you'll really enjoy it. If you think this sounds interesting... Here, let me see if I can find it on Rift Books. Um, see how cheap we can get this. The Raccoon Next Door. Holy cow, there you go. You can get it in very good condition for less than $5. Here's a link. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Good stuff. Anyway. Um. The tiger that went for a pint. Yeah. There you go, Pontius Pirate. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. And Cast the Dreamer says, is a guy on YouTube who lives next to the woods and feeds the raccoons hot dogs? Oh no, Cast, that doesn't sound great. Well, there's a... There's a channel on Twitch called Critter Vision. Applaud the work of vertebrate paleontologists. Thank you, Positron, for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Uh, um, Critter Vision is what that channel is called. And man, it's already nighttime there? Shoot, I guess they're on the East Coast. They're like in North Carolina or something. But normally there's raccoons and opossums and occasional squirrels and deer during the daytime. But nobody really doing much right now. But that's Critter Vision here on Twitch. Good stuff. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Cassidy Drew says, I've seen this stream while there were raccoons. There are usually raccoons. I'm actually really surprised that nothing's going on right now. Like, is this live? Did the camera freeze? Huh. Yeah. And yet, Hoot House livestream, we'll, we'll probably raid into them tonight, 25A. Because it is Thursday Birds Day, apart from being National Serpent Day. But yeah. And holy cow, Will 6 2. Thank you, thank you, Will, for those 20 gift subs. Last time I'll play with a dinosaur. Yeah! Will 62, thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Thank you for that incredible support. That is extraordinary, and I really appreciate it. 20 gift subs. That's as many as two tens. And that's wonderful. I appreciate that, Will 62. Thank you, thank you. There's 20 people in the chat now. Ads are a thing of the past for them for the next month. Thank you, Will, for your support of, of Science Outreach, your generosity. I appreciate you, Will. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and are, are raccoons Ursa? That's a great question, Z Black Rider. Let's, let's talk about that here. And then we can transition into snakes from here. Let's pull up our tree of life. Raccoons are actually a group for, called Procyonids. So they're related to bears, but they're not bears. They're like a sister group to bears. Let's go to mammals. Right here. Like we often do for, uh, for Metazoa. There we go. There's our mammals. Yeah, which includes everything from opossums to manatees and dugongs, hedgehogs and echidnas, rabbits... Whales and bats and cats and dribbles and us, humans. We're all mammals. Now, let's go to the bears. Ursidae are way over here. Yeah, bears. There's eight species of living bear. And that's, yeah, it's great. Brown bears, black bears, polar bears, pandas, sun bears, Asiatic black bears, Sloth bears and Andean bears, a.k.a. Spectacle bears, I think. Anyway, raccoons are in genus Procyon. So bears are genus Ursus and a couple other genera. 
Raccoons are over here. Genus Procyon. I didn't realize there were three different species. That's pretty cool. So yeah. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. Yeah. And Alexander Morrison says, Bear-sized raccoon sounds like a good time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> It'll just carry your garbage can away. Rather than knocking it over or opening the lid on it. It'll just take it. Uh, no, we're going to be talking about bear-sized rats. Well, not true rats, but bear-sized rodents tomorrow. On Groundhog Day, we're having a special rodent stream tomorrow. That's going to be nice. Yeah. Um. Anyway, let's jump from them back to mammals over here. And then from mammals, let's jump to Serpentes, the snakes, which are not a kind of uh, mammal, obviously not. They're reptiles, just like lizards, just like crocodiles, just like birds. Snakes are a kind of reptile. And they have Najosh on here? That's interesting. This is one of those le leggy snakes, isn't it? That's odd. Anyway, snakes. There's 3,800 species of snakes. Or something like that. And, uh... Let's see if we can find a decent video just kind of introducing snakes as a group. Do we have a video just talking about snakes in general? Not any specific snake, but just... Snakes? Um... Yeah, maybe not. I'm surprised by this, actually. Um, introduction to snakes. Uh, well, let's try this right here from Nine News. These are always fun when you've got the the animal guy who shows up on the talk show or the news channel or the school assembly, almost always wearing like a kind of shirt that I might wear, <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Uh, like a military surplus shirt or a safari shirt. We might have the same thing here. Let's take a look. National Snake Day is Oh, no, T-shirt. So okay. we brought in some of our slithery friends to learn a little bit more about them. Devin Jaffe knows all about these guys. She is the executive director at Nature's Educators. Thank you both awesome. so much for coming in. Yeah. You're handling the snakes, snakes but I'm going to be handling them too. I'm very <laughs> excited. So who'd you bring in today? Okay, so we have four friends that we've brought, and our first friend actually is our glossy snake. These guys actually are native here in Colorado, but are, are fairly hard to see because they are in our- Steely Dan says, maybe Jeff Corwin brought snakes to a late show at some point? Oh man, Steely Dan, we should check. Jeff Corwin was one of my heroes growing up. Holy cow, yeah. Yeah. Eternal species. And you can see why they're called the glossy snake. They're really shiny underneath. Mm -hmm. oh. Very, very shiny. And these guys tend to eat um, reptiles and other uh, amphibians and things like that. But they'll also eat small mice. Okay. Rodents. Who else do you have? This is peaches. Are we peaches. Oh, <laughs> peaches. <laughs> <laughs> this I is peaches. It. And she's a bull snake. She's also a native. Here in ah, the bull snakes. These species. Oh, I have a bull here. snake in my yard. They're great. These guys, yeah, they're very, very helpful. And I'm gotta say i'm impressed with our host here presumably she works here at the network and she's like you know oh, oh man i love the i have a bull snake in my yard i love these guys good for her holy cow um the clippers is proud of the news lady yeah maybe she had something to do with this segment she's like we should have a snake segment you know i love that i love that both of these species. Oh, I have a bull here. snake in my yard. They're great. These guys, yeah, they're very, very helpful in the environment. Some people call them a gopher snake, so they will eat gophers. 
um, Wonderful. as well as other small animals. Are they dangerous at all to humans? No. Mm -mm, nope. These guys are pretty shy. They're very good at imitating a rattlesnake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can see by the coloration they look similar. So not just similar coloration to a rattlesnake, but they also, when they're trying to look like a rattlesnake, if you're like provoking a, a bull snake like this, um, they'll like flatten their head to make them look like a pit viper. So they'll actually like squash down part of their head and they're like, oh, look at me, I'm a rattlesnake, stay away. And they'll twitch their tail back and forth because if they get lucky, their tail will be in some dry leaves or something like that and it'll make kind of a rattling noise. Oh, they're so cool. They're so cool. This, this one actually is hypomelanistic, so missing pigmentation. They oh. tend to be a little darker than this yeah, one. Yeah, this one looks odd. the difference between this and a rattlesnake, just the tail? Great question. So the tail is one. Um, these guys will vibrate their tail in the grass to make a shaking sound, just like a rattlesnake. What I just tell you? Um, but usually it's the coloration. <laughs> these guys also are a lot bigger uh. when they're an adult. And the bull snake is the longest. <laughs> Stolen snake valor. There you go, Pontius Pirate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep, yep, and that's mimicry. Yeah, now isn't that cool? A snake that we have here in yeah. is that full grown right now? She's full size. Yep. Okay. Yep. We yeah. only need, we know that she's a she is because she's laid, she laid eggs. eggs. Otherwise, yeah. you can't really tell. Like it's we don't really know the glossy tell. one, right? I have no idea if that's a male or a female. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes the yeah. can one. tell us. Yeah. This one we don't know either. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, there's there's a, a different a uh, couple different ways that we can tell male and female. The females tend to be larger. That's um, right. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> and the, again, this is so cool. Like, I this is a thing on on. I don't know. I saw this on Twitter a while. I don't know how long ago, but it was there was some sort of viral tweet, and it's like, like does anybody remember like a snake lady who would come to their school with a bunch of snakes, and then they would just have a school assembly, and everybody would touch the snakes. It's like, who was that lady? What are her qualifications? How do I become the snake lady? <laughs> and I love that that's just like an archetype, you know. And that's and that's her. Like this is this is so cool. Oh man. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> um, but some of our guys we don't necessarily know, and, and then we have eggs, and we're like, oh, okay, well, we thought Surprise. you were. That's male. interesting, Will. Um, huh. So this one, actually, if you want to hold this. Okay. An owl guy. Too, That's neat now. Our reticulated python. Um, so this snake is a juvenile. He will get much bigger. The reticulated python and Burmese python are the longest species of snakes. Yeah. Um, so these guys live in Asia. I'm channeling my inner Britney Spears right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a soft snake. Very, very soft, very small scales. And um, this is not even full grown, you were saying? No, that's crazy. These not even close. Much, much larger than that. Yeah. Okay. Did she say reticulated python? Because I think that the reticulated python might hold the record for the longest living snake. Anacondas are the largest, and that they can get really, really heavy. But I think reticulated pythons, they might not weigh as much, but they get longer. I think that's the case. Okay, and I'm handling her correctly. Oh, yeah, okay, cool. Well, thank correctly. you. Her, yeah. and, and, okay. And you know what? Snakes don't have ears, so it doesn't matter. Whatever okay. you want to Sorry. <laughs> so they get, yeah, they taste with their tongue. Um, they don't have eyelids. They have a protective scale over their eyes so they don't blink. Yeah. Okay. Um, they don't have any ears. They're very sensitive to vibration. Oh, look at that Super shot cool. there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, do they get along? Is there a reason we're pulling them out while separately? Yeah, no, they don't really get along together. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we, we keep everybody individually. We do keep all of our, our bull snakes together, but they have a, a fairly large enclosure, so okay. they're hanging out together in their own. Oh, that's cool, Mel. That's but cool. For the most part, these guys don't really hang out in groups. Wow, you, you licked my arm. Yeah. That's special. And we're saving the <laughs> largest mama for last, yes. right? Ooh, is that going to so be a boa large, constrictor? Yeah. It looks like a boa pattern there. there you go. And that friend. couple, like, that plastic tote. Our next friend. Snakes are so cool. What's your friend's name? This one, we call her Big Mama. <laughs> Big Mama. <laughs> Fitting. <laughs> yes. And she actually is uh, one of my favorite species. She's a Dumeril's boa constrictor. Oh. Uh, these guys are from the island of Madagascar. And they're oh. on the island, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Very they're sometimes cool. Sometimes confused with the Madagascar ground boa, but they are um, a little bit different um, with coloration and pattern. And so she's she's large. If you want to hold her, you can. She's yeah. 25 pounds. She's 25 pounds? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Go. She's very sweet. She's a very friendly snake. She weighs more than some people in chat, I'm sure. These guys are beautiful, but unfortunately, a, a lot of them were hunted um, due to. She's okay. She's getting warm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These guys were hunted due to the coloration on their skin. I don't know if you can see the, the shine, Aww. the pattern yeah. on their skin. She's beautiful. So people were, were killing them, unfortunately, for Aww. belts and boots and things like that. People get so jealous of things that, like, they can't have. They're like, oh, that snake has such beautiful skin. It's prettier than my skin. Let's kill it. <laughs> That's such a horrible impulse that people have. 
You know, I. Ugh. Ugh. That's so as well sad. as as eating. What a beautiful sad. creature. Where are you going you know? there, Big Mama? Like, this is Where funny. are you going, Big Mama? How big oh. will she get? Is she's full size. Okay. This is all the bigger that she's going to get. And we know she's a girl yep. because she laid she's eggs. She's laid eggs. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bo more about Nature's Educators. Yeah, so we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Sedalia area. And we travel to um, schools and libraries, nature centers, festivals, events, everything to be able to teach about our friends like this. Where, where's Pretty Big cool. Mama going? <laughs> you hear the... You hear the <laughs> going on there that's because this snake is like going up past her microphone <laughs> ah, that's so great oh i love that i love that and we travel to um schools and libraries nature centers festivals events everything to be able to teach about our friends look, look, like this look. Where, where's big mama going in your hair <laughs> oh, man. she likes to sit with with your hair yeah <laughs> She mm -hmm. is right up past the mic, yeah. Quite experiencing things right now. <laughs> what do you want people to know about snakes? Because I feel like they really get a bad hey, Richard Roadshow, so, welcome. Yeah, these guys are just so important in our ecosystem, and and to see them, we don't want to, you know, uh, get afraid of them or anything. I mean, clearly, she's none of these guys are are secretly plotting to sneak out and get right. any of us. Okay, so um, we yeah. we have to have snakes in our ecosystem because they are keeping our food chain um, working. Where they're keeping our ecosystem here in balance. Mm -hmm. We have. See, how she says this announcer is braver than some male news anchor probably most of them say tauchi yes different species of snakes here mad respect of course, paleo salute to her bone or reticulated python but we will see uh, like i really think that maybe she i get some sense that that this news anchor here invited these folks and she's like let's have a snake segment i like snakes snakes are cool you know and we need more people like that you know we need more people like that we need Kevin Hart in the corner screaming. Is Kevin Hart afraid of snakes? That's embarrassing. <laughs> uh, and Jeff Corn snake video from last. Oh, thank you, Steely Den. We'll take a look at that. Bull snakes. We'll see uh, snake garter snakes, rattlesnakes, and they all play an important role in our ecosystem. So although some of us are a little afraid, and that's okay, yeah. we all have something we're a little worried about, and that's totally fine. But. There is no snake that's secretly plotting to get you. Okay. I mean, that's what yeah. I can Gotta say. put it out there. <laughs> yes. Well, I so appreciate you guys so much for coming in, yes. bringing mm -hmm. these amazing snakes. Big Mama's my favorite. This is her doing. No offense to the other big, one, please, yeah. so they don't have ears. Big so props to her. Anyway. <laughs> We're going to put all the information about Nature's Educators and Snake Week on our website at 9news.com. Thank you guys again. Thank you. Kylie, I hear you scrolling. Oh, my over God. There. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a link to that video right there. Good stuff. I love to see. Uh, Somebody from the news who is not afraid of snakes. Somebody in media. You know, I... It could go without saying, but, like, it's it's just really nice to see... You know, like... A, a news lady like this, you know, but she's got her very professional dress makeup and her hair and everything and her really nice nails and jewelry and she's just cool and chill and like chill with the snake it kind of goes against stereotypes that people have and I think that's really really important so major kudos to her again what was uh I don't know what her name is, but major props. Yeah. It should have more views than it has. You know? Yeah. Anyway. There's a Brian Fellows skit about snakes. You're not doing so badly yourself for a paleontologist. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Pusco3, and thank you for that follow. Appreciate the kind words. I appreciate you clicking that follow button. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, and I'll see you later, Alex Vixen. Yeah. And I did link the video, Claire. Here it is again. Yeah. Uh, and Steely Dan, thank you for this video here. Oh, very cool. So, oh, hello, Moon Pie. 
Hang on, are we gonna get a moon pie visit here? That would be a stream first, a first time on paleontologizing. Hey, moon pie. You wanna come up here? Come on up here. Yeah. You wanna come up here, moon pie? Okay. Moon pie doesn't like treats, so I can't bribe her to come up on the desk. But. Come here, Moonpie. Come on up here. Come on up. Come on up. You can get some pets if you jump up on my lap. Come on up. Yeah. Come on up. Come here, Moonpie. Come here. Yeah. Hey. Okay. He's working up to it, Chad. Come on up. This will be a first time. Oh, there we go. It's Moon Pie. Hello, Moon Pie. Yeah. Hello, hello. Oh, Moon Pie. This is a paleontologizing first chat. This is Moon Pie. <laughs> I feel like I'm chronicling the, or, uh, or uh, channeling our our. Uh, wildlife assembly person. Uh, so this is Moon Pie. Moon Pie is a domestic short hair cat. A scientific name Felis Catus. Now she lives here in this house and she lets me live here too and I am very fortunate for that. She's lived here for years more than I have. Yeah. Oh, Moon Pie. Moonpie doesn't like treats, but she does like microphones a lot. And Moonpie, you're just shedding hair everywhere. Can I brush you? Can I brush you? Would you like that? Oh, this is the first time she's never appeared on stream before. The other cats, it's easy to get them to come up here. Because they, uh, they really like those treats. Moonpie does not care for treats. She's suspicious of them. She doesn't eat them. stuff, Moon Pie. Oh, there you go. Okay, I'll see you later, I guess. Thanks for being here, Moon Pie. Yeah. There we go. Whoop. Can I use the brush on you? Yeah. Um, Longtime viewers of Ios' stream will be very familiar with Moonpie. Moonpie spends a lot of time on Ios's desk. Loves to rub up against the microphone and that. But, uh... Yeah. She's here investigating. Oh, she's sniffing the tree fern. Look at you. Look at you. Down there. Investigating the tree fern. There we go. Oh, there's a tail. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. Where'd you go? I don't want to run over your paws with the chair wheels. There we go, Moon Pie. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. Um. Good old Moon Pie. Now, uh. Steely Dan, thank you for posting this. This guy right here, holding the snake was a childhood hero of mine. Jeff Corwin, herpetologist and, uh, yeah, uh, great admirer of reptiles and amphibians. Now, isn't that just absolutely gorgeous? Hey guys, Jeff Corwin here. So, behold, you're looking at my favorite species. Well, I'll be honest, this is my second favorite species uh -huh. of North American snake. But when I'm in Florida, this is number one. My first favorite, is the eastern hognose snake but huh. this creature right here is why i fell in love with florida this is the eastern indigo snake beautiful it is the king of this ecosystem right here so i'm right now with the sanibel captiva conservation foundation and their mission is to protect creatures like this at one time the incredible <laughs> indigo snake 
snaked its way from Alabama to the Florida Keys because of habitat loss, collisions with cars. They practically disappeared in some places, wow. now endangered. But there's a big effort underway to try to recover and protect this species. Right here on one of the little extensions of Captiva, they're doing a lot of work to protect this creature. The number one challenge today, people running over these snakes with their vehicles. This is the longest, one of the longest species of snakes in North America, if not the longest. They're a very long-lived snake. They have big home ranges or territories, like a male indigo snake can have a couple of miles in habitat, and that's a lot of space in Florida. Thousands of people move to Florida every day, and when they do, a beautiful piece of old, wild Florida like this disappears. But we uh. can find that balance. We can find that partnership, and if we do, species like this, the incredible indigo snake, will survive. And if you want to know how you can help, just reach out She's to back. the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation, oh. and you can be a part of the mission to save this incredible snake. Very nice. Well, thank you, Jeff Corwin there, and uh, Moon Pie. Hi. Well, well, well. Hello, Moon Pie. She's made a return trip. It's good to see you, Moon Pie. This makes me so happy. I didn't know if you would ever appear on stream. And now here you are. She's expanding her territory, chat. That is one. Oh, there she goes. Oh, you want to sit on the ground? Okay. Well, you know you can get all kinds of attention anytime you want, Moon Pie. Okay? Yeah. Here you go. <laughs> Oh, oh, Moon Pie. Anyway, here is a a link to that video right there with Jeff Corwin. Um, as a kid, growing up, um, you know, I always wanted to be a dinosaur paleontologist. But for a while, I thought, wouldn't it be really cool to also be a herpetologist? Study reptiles and amphibians? protect them from extinction protect their habitats and help them thrive uh, yeah and like a big part of that was uh, <laughs> was uh, was this guy right here Jeff Corwin even in present-day Madagascar a role model for me growing up hideous creatures still forage for prey Check it out. What a fantastic creature. I feel like I'm looking at a Muppet, some sort of puppet created by a human being, but in fact, this is a live, <laughs> breathing chameleon, and it is the smallest species of chameleon in the world. This is Brigesia minima. I wish I was a scientist that had discovered this little lizard. I would have named him Brookesia Minima. I would have named him Brookesia Tiny Timina. <laughs> In the movies, there's a long standing tradition of dinosaurs chasing people. Of oh course, boy, yeah. Dinosaurs were long gone before humans came along, but Except I can for birds? dream, can't yeah. I? Ah! 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 Mother of God! <laughs> Mother of God! Why do we move next to this power plant? No! You can't hear me, I'm a herpetologist! No! <laughs> <laughs> I remember that clip from when I was a kid. Oh, that's so good. I didn't make an alert out of that. That is fantastic. In fact, let me take a note right now. Jeff Corbin alert. There we go. Yeah. You remember that clip too? Isn't that great, Bulganek? Yeah. Here, so 
we've got uh, the Jeff Corwin Snake Tacular. Given that it is National Serpent Day, let's talk about this. My world is filled with serpents. We're going to explore that world from the rainforests of South America. Ooh, you're feisty. To the swamps of Louisiana, a brand new <laughs> Zydeco music. water moccasin, but <laughs> it is armed with venom. The deserts of Africa. If you don't get the anti-venom, you're Clint's going to reptiles. die. Clint's reptiles? I have seen some of his stuff. And Beards, yeah, yeah, good stuff. Like you very much. He even does occasional dinosaur forward, videos that I've seen. we'll look at some of the most incredible animals on our planet. Oh, man, you're not a nice snake. On my most snake-tacular Jeff Corwin experience. This is back when Animal Planet actually had shows about animals. Instead of... Bigfoot ghost truckers and yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff Crowen, and I want to welcome you to my Snake Tacular. Now, the object of this special episode is to revisit Good old days. some of our yep. best snake yep. encounters. I also want to take you around the world, a world filled with my favorite creatures. You've guessed it, snakes. Now, as you probably know, and wait, and Clint's reptiles is up in Utah. I spend a lot of time in Utah. Maybe I should link up with them. That sounds cool. Yeah, Tommy Plodicus says, Hey, I like Bigfoot ghost truckers. <laughs> Ancient alien of Bigfoot ghost trucker pond stars. Uh, ice ghost truckers. Yeah, there you go, Pimpcat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I... How in the world does Jeff Corwin not still have a show? How is he not, like, an international celebrity nowadays? I don't understand that. It, it just speaks to something, like, perverse and how media works, and that someone who is, like, legitimately a scientist, and I assume that, that Jeff Corwin is published in the scientific literature, so he would be legitimately a scientist. He's very, very good on camera, very charismatic. How is he not a superstar nowadays? You know? Wait, and Wildlife Nation with Jeff Corrin, ABC 2021. Is that right, Murph? Does he have a show? And how do I not know about this? Um, Yeah, Wildlife Nation with Jeff Corwin. Well... A new series is launching this weekend as part of Lytton's Weekend Adventure Wildlife Nation showcases the dedicated environmental heroes that rescue, rehabilitate, preserve and protect the natural habitats of the amazing creatures in North America. And joining us huh. live this morning is host Jeff Corwin. Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. This well, good for him. Right in if that's OK. What Excellent. was the inspiration behind this new series? Well, thanks everyone for having me on this morning. Well, the inspiration for the series is really to connect everyone who all of us collectively share our wild backyard and it's designed to connect all of us to nature and inspire a strong sense of environmental stewardship and uh, it really came out of the covid period where we had the realization that we weren't going internationally anytime soon and we partnered up with this great he looks like matt damon organization Fine. maybe Celtic wildlife yeah. welcome by the way Together, good to see you we created this amazing roller coaster ride to the natural world where we traveled from east coast to west from alaska to florida exploring the incredible natural heritage that belongs to all of us we know we have a lot of wildlife here in florida that's for sure uh, what are you really hoping that people will get out of this show well there's lots of things i want people to feel inspired about when they watch this show number one we we live in such a time of tremendous environmental challenges. It's often argued yeah. that we are the last generation to truly determine what our wild planet will be like. But there's also a lot of hope and there's a lot of opportunity. And Florida is a big part of our story. We look at everything from manatees to indigo snakes. We have an incredible story about gopher tortoise. Florida really might be the most remarkable state in terms of wildlife, honestly. Florida has things that no other states have, and they have a lot of things that a lot of other states have, too. Oh, man, Florida is such a special place. It really is. Like, in terms of wildlife, it is... It is unique. Tortoises, 
about coral restoration, crocodiles in Southern Florida. We actually see how she says a lot of old nature show hosts have either just retired and moved on to conservation work. Really is the front lines when it comes to conservation. But we also want to inspire a strong sense of the value of science. And if I get word or feedback that someone's kid is inspired to look at science as an opportunity for a career in their future and have a connection to nature and environmental stewardship, I think that would be a job well done for this television series. Celtic Elephant says Florida also has bison, which is crazy. Do they have bison today? I know they used to have bison a long time ago when... um when like Spanish explorers were first like visiting Florida and looking for the fountain of youth and whatever nonsense they were up to, they reported seeing bison like in Southern Florida. Um, yeah, very small population of them. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Florida is part of the natural range for bison. Yeah. It's crazy that like you can have all of these different, really, really cool critters along this peninsula You know, black bears, mountain lions, a.k.a. Florida panthers, alligators and crocodiles, all kinds of different turtles and birds and manatees. Also, you know, bison and deer and... Florida is the only place in the United States where there are wild cycads. Cycads are my favorite kind of plant. They're, uh... These were dominant during the Mesozoic era. During the Jurassic period, for instance, cycads were everywhere. They're like the quintessential, like, dinosaur age plant. And today, they're not very common. There's not very many species of them around the world. But in the United States, the only U.S. state that has native cycads is Florida. With the Kunti cycad. Uh, Zamia Integraflora, I think? Yeah. Um, really, really cool plant. Florida is the only place in the U.S. where they grow. Where you have any kind of cycad. This once dominant order of, of gymnosperm plants, the only place you can see them in the wild today is in Florida. In the U.S., at least. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, King Zoggy says, I would go to Florida solely to see all the wildlife. That's a good reason. Holy cow. Yeah. Yeah. And Metazua just refreshed. Thank you, Real Mangrove Beards. Here, let's do that, and then we'll get back into, uh, we'll watch the Jeff Corrin Snaketacular Special, or whatever it was called. Good stuff. Uh, Metazua. Let's see what our mystery animal of the day is. We'll get in here. Give me the name of a, uh, a placental mammal, chat. We'll start off with that. I could start off with a snake today, but... We didn't do super hot yesterday in terms of points, so... Raccoon. Thank you, SB. Raccoon. That's a good one. Let's start off with a raccoon. But now the dinosaurs rule. And Agabney. Thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. And, oh boy, that was a good guess. That was a good guess. Uh, Agabney, we are playing Metazoo right now, which is uh, an animal guessing game. Each day it resets and there's a new mystery animal for the day. We're going to try and figure out what this one is. Um, so the way that it works is you type an animal name into here, and then it will show you the smallest clade, the smallest evolutionary group on the Tree of Life that includes your guess and the mystery animal. So for here it's Laurasia Theria. This game is kind of heavily skewed toward placental mammals, which, you know, for better or for worse, that's the way it is. But let me show you what this means. Mammals. We got here on our tree of life. Uh, mammals. There we go. Now, we searched raccoon. And it gave us Laurasia Theria here. So Laurasia Theres are a group that includes uh, ungulates, bats, carnivorans, uh, hedgehogs, I think, insectivores, critters like that. So 
mammals, therian mammals, placental mammals, boroeutheria, and laurasiotheria. There we go. So pretty good. In just one guess, we've been able to narrow it down from over a million species of animals down to just 2,000 species. That's pretty decent. But now we've got all these different groups of mammals here. Let's try and narrow it down further. Let's see if it's a carnivoran. Carnivorans are uh, this group of mammals. They also seem to be heavily represented in this game. Give me the name of a carnivoran, chat. Give me the name of a carnivoran, and we'll see if it's one of them. Uh, hyena. Well, we did hyena yesterday, Celtic Elephant. Red Fox. Thank you, Mary. Let's try that. Red Fox. The the animal. Volpe's Volpe's. Not the comedian. Red Fox. Let's try that. And... Oh, shoot. No. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. We already did a carnivorin. I just squandered a guess there. I'm sorry. Darn it. Well, we know it's definitely not a carnivorin or a caniform. We're too fast here. Let's slow down. Let's think about this, you know? Yeah. Um, I shouldn't have asked for a carnivorin. That was my fault. Obviously. Let's go back to Laurasia Theria here. So, we know it's not a carnivorin. Let's see if it's some kind of artiodactyl, a cloven-hoofed ungulate. This also includes whales. Um, give me the name of a cloven-hoofed ungulate, chat. We'll try... Llama, we did... Well, we, we did alpaca yesterday now, so... Dolphin, I like that beard, so let's do dolphin. There we go. And, okay, it is an artiodactyl. That's good, but it's not a dolphin. Hmm. Um, this gives us some good information. So. Dolphins are part of this group. Right here. I don't know what they're called. Let's figure out what this clade is called. It should say here on the tree, but it doesn't. Um... Cetacea, and then we'll go up one clade from there, from Cetacea to Cetacea Morpha? Or Whip... Whippo Morpha? Wait, what? I'm sorry, what? Whippo Morpha? I've never heard this term before, but it really seems like it might just be a kind of a goofy portmanteau of Whales and hippos. Yeah, throw whales and hippos together, Celtic Elephant. You get Whippomorpha, maybe. Is it... Is that really where that comes from? The name of Whippomorpha is a combination of the English whale and hippo. <laughs> oh, that's so fantastic. That is so good. That is so cool. Oh, man, I'm so glad we looked this up. Yeah. And would it not be a true portmanteau? A true portmanteau would be both words in their entirety? Are you sure, Espy? I don't think that's the case. Well, it could be. That sounds more like a compound word. Anyway, Whippomorpha. Really cool. I don't think it's within Whippomorpha. I love this, this image. We've got whales, hippos, Pachycetus, and Indohyus all together there. That's really neat. Um, we were talking about the evolution of whales yesterday. Um, really neat. So, we know it's not within Whippomorpha, but it's some other kind of artiodactyl, our mystery animal. It could be... Could be any one of these. Let's try and find... We were talking about mouse deer yesterday. Remember how we were talking about Chevrolet? 
Do you have retains? Yeah, and were Desma Stylians Whippomorphs? I don't think they were, no, but I'm not totally sure. I think they're from a different group. Um, let's see if there's another major split here. We've got Bovids. You know, let's see if it's a Bovid. Give me the name of a Bovid, chat. And we'll go with that. That'll be our guess. Um, yeah. We've got Bison and Bison there. Well, just by consensus, let's do Bison. Like we said yesterday. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Pecora. So, it is a ruminant mammal. Let's look up played Pecora right here. An infra order of even to even hoofed mammals with ruminant digestion. And that apparently includes the chevrotains, because there's that I think that might be a chevrotain there. Or it might be something else. With those fangs. Um I guess we don't have Picora here. At least it's not labeled as such. But yeah. Um well. We know it's not a Bovid. Being smart about this, because within Bovidae, you've got these critters, but we guessed bison. If it were a Bovid, it would say Bovidae, which it doesn't. It could instead be something like a reindeer or a mootjack or some kind of deer. Or it could be a giraffe or a pronghorn. Let's see if it's some kind of deer. Let's try deer and see if that gets us. And that's it! Yeah. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Yeah. Excellent. You know, and we got it on only, only five guesses. That's not too shabby. We would have gotten it in four if I had been smarter about this. But I was not as smart as I should have been. You know? Um, but anyway, not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah. Can we find a quick video on deer? Um, Cerveday. Let's try this. And hey, sweetie pie. Hello, you want to come up here? You know, we can play our own music. Thank you very much. Uh, dear, 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 where the deer and the antelope play, where they play video games. Steely Dan, twitch.tv. Anyway, come here. Come here, sweetie pie. Can I entice you over here? Come here. Oh, and there's mini pie. Uh-oh. We might have a cat power struggle here. Ooh. We got a treat here. We got a treat. Look at that. You know how to get it if you want it, sweetie pie. Anyway, yeah. Deer. Deer are cool. Here, let's take a look at this, maybe. Deer size comparison? What is this going to be like? Hmm. What is this music? Hang on. Am I going to get DMCA'd for this? Uh, YouTube audio library. No, I think we're good. Let's look at all these different deer over the years. And, you know what, let's... And speeding this up. Yeah, a 
and lots and lots of deer. And more deer. And more. They're increasing in size. Uh-oh. Why are they doing that? That's because that's how this video is structured. Bigger and bigger. Oh, pair of David's deer. Extinct in the wild. one of these in Lord of the Rings. Didn't they have a Megalosaurus or something similar to that? I don't really remember. Uh, anyway, here's a link to that video if you're interested. Yeah. Um... Yeah. Here, I remember, I remember, I haven't actually seen that movie, I don't think, but here was, uh, yeah, a, a video where they, you know, they made a bunch of improvements to the Hobbit series, and one of them was, um, was adding more lasers and special effects, I believe. Um, yeah, like this. Oh, hang on a second. Um, sorry, we're still at double playback speed. Yeah, more visual effects. Yeah. I didn't see this movie. <laughs> the Who's that? No idea. That's gone down there. And then this is why I thought of this. Isn't that supposed to be a Megalosaurus right there? Right here? This guy's riding it? I don't know the context here. I haven't seen these movies. <laughs> anyway. Um... Here's uh, here's a link to that video. Good stuff. Um. Yeah. <laughs> did the wait? Did the did the deer have laser eyes too? I guess it didn't. I thought it did, but I guess it doesn't. Pendrake, you and me both, you know? I don't really know what's going on here, but let's get back to... Snakes! For National Serpent Day. There we go. July snake tacular. Now, the object of this special episode is to revisit some of our best snake encounters. I also want to take you around the world, a world filled with my favorite creatures, you've guessed it, snakes. Now, as you probably know from watching the show, yeah, cast the dreamer, yeah. these creatures, I am fascinated by snakes. And what I really like to do, my most favorite thing, is to take information on these animals and share them with people. People just like yourselves. Hmm. Now, I can't think of a better way for... Personally, I like to share information with snakes, but, um... But sharing information about snakes with people is also cool, you know? Now, earnestly... I'm really, really glad to hear that Jeff Corwin is still 
working and still making television and doing science outreach like this that's really really important and how cool is that to launch our snake tacular yeah. special than with this north american beauty of course if you want to identify the snake just look at that stack of dead skin at the end of its tail and it tells yeah. you that it's a rattlesnake this one the western diamondback rattler not of the and this you see what he's holding right there that's called a snake stick and i have one of those that i always bring with me into the field let me go get it. Here, I'll be right back, and I'll continue the video. Roughly 30 species of rattlesnakes in the New World. This one can be potentially the most dangerous. Now, this viper has a cousin. Very different in appearance, very beautiful. To find it, we have to go to a small island off the coast of Brazil. Welcome to Queimada Grande. No humans live here, and no wonder, because this island is crawling with deadly vipers. It's a four-hour boat ride from here to the mainland, and the Brazilian government requires us to bring anti-venom. Wow. Look at that. Uh, here is my snake stick right here. Um, I always bring this with me into the field. When I'm out digging dinosaurs, and usually I just keep it in my car, honestly. Um, because one of the most common places you'll encounter a snake is on the road. And if a snake is just hanging out in the middle of the road, it might get run over. And so it really helps to have an implement with which to pick up a snake. Especially if it's a venomous snake, like a rattler. This is a really, really good thing to have. Um... Yeah, because I don't like to see snakes get run over, you know? I try and save them whenever I can. So this, it's funny, the handle, I guess that grip on it is like the same as, it's probably manufactured for a golf club. But, uh, but nope, it's something way cooler than that. It's a snake stick. This past summer, I was lucky enough to run into some beautiful snakes right at the end of the field season in uh, in Utah. And let me find those. Yeah, here's me with that snake stick. And then there is one of the Pygmy Prairie Rattlers, Crotalus something something, I don't know, that I helped relocate. Beautiful snake there. Okay, let's look them up on the Tree of Life. Um, Pygmy Rattler. Pygmy Rattlesnake, there we go. Uh, there we go, yeah. Cistrurus meliaris, I'm not 100% sure this is the actual snake. Let's see, Southeastern United States, yeah, that's not true, that's not correct. This is not the right kind of rattlesnake. Um, Crotalus. It's going to be closer to this guy, the Australia original rattlesnake, I guess. Timber rattlesnake. Hmm. Hang on, let me try and find this. Western Pygmy Rattlesnake. There we go. Nope. Southern Missouri? That doesn't sound right. Uh, um. This is Tri Prairie Rattlesnake. Uh, Crotalus Viridus. There we go. Yeah. Uh, cool stuff. They are beautiful animals. They really are. And 
Nope, this doesn't match up. This doesn't match up with where I was this summer. Um, there's only like the southeast corner of Utah that's covered by their range here, and that's not where I... That's not where I was. I was further north than that. Um, so that's not right. Yeah. Let's look at G genus Crotalis here. There we go. Uh, Crotalis Pricei, that might make more sense. What's their range map like? Yeah, nope. Uh-oh, not there. Mm. Here, I think I actually had it on... On, um... iNaturalist. Let me log in here and look up my... Oh boy, this is going to be a pain in the butt, isn't it? Let me just look at it on my phone and then I can show you. Yeah. And... Oh, very cool, Gucci Guda. That's super, super cool. Let's find this on iNaturalist real quick. I will scroll through here, and I will find it. Midget Faded Rattlesnake. Cortalis Oreganus Concolor, they're saying. If you don't have this app, then holy cow, this would be a wonderful thing to have if you're into critters like this. Yeah, the Midget Faded Rattlesnake. Right there. If you're the sort of person who encounters living things in the wild and you like to be able to identify them, this app is tremendously helpful in that regard. Um, Brutalis, Oregonus, Concolor. There we go. The midget faded rattlesnake. Faded rattlesnake or yellow rattlesnake. Um, and they've got a pretty small range. Just Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. Christopher Wallace, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And Jaded Fairy, that app is called iNaturalist. Here, I will, I'll show you. Well, after I show you some more photos of this, uh... This beautiful critter. So, uh... There it was in camp as we were packing up. Right there. Pretty pretty small rattler there. And so I decided, hey, let me go get my snake stick and let me transport this critter to safety in one of my plastic bins there. Yeah, she's a beauty. I think I caught two snakes that day. Yeah. And the same tables used on your Grand Canyon trips? Yeah, these rolling tables, they're designed for, like, river rafters and people like that, but but we, uh, we use them in the field for digging I'm dinosaurs. Yeah. Anyway, very cool. Um, the reason I was able to identify this down to the species and subspecies level is because of this wonderful app. Uh, yeah. Um, here, take a look. Okay, install the iNaturalist app and create an account. Time to get outside and record your first observation. Here's how to do it. Any living thing, like a plant, animal, or fungus, can be an observation on iNaturalist. <laughs> Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap observe and take a photo. The infant. You can review your picture. The adult. Ontogeny. Rabbit Weenus, thank you for the 23 months of support. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
Thanks for keeping me online for that long. 23 months is a long time. Thank you, thank I hit you. hit next if it looks good. Uh, to identify it, hit what did you see? If you have an internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest 10 visually similar species and often a common ancestor. You can choose yeah. one of those or search for a species name. On this observation detail screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. Yep. Hey, sweetie pie, come on over here. The date, time, and location have been automatically added. You can also change the geo-privacy of the observation, mark whether it's captive or cultivated, hey, or add it to a project. Come on up here. Once you're finished, just hit share, and your observation mm. will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. That's it. Keep on exploring and sharing. Good stuff. And so the really cool thing about iNaturalist is that researchers will actually use this data. They'll use these data in, in different studies. Um, it's pretty neat. Yeah. iNaturalist is a social network where anyone can record and share their photographs of living things. When you share a photograph on iNaturalist, it becomes more than just a picture. It becomes an observation. It's a record of an organism in a place at a time. Each observation is shared with a global community of naturalists, where it can be identified, discussed, and used to give us a greater understanding of life on Earth. Wherever you are, biodiversity is there too. Get out and observe it. So yeah, one of my very, very favorite apps, iNaturalist. Wonderful. And like any time I go to a new place, whether I'm on vacation or on a work trip or a research collections visit or whatever, it gives me an excuse to go outside and photograph some new living things that aren't in my neighborhood back home. And that's really, really cool to have, you know? Just to have a, a reason to go outside and, and look for things. It's like, I don't know, it's like Pokemon Go, except you're looking for real organisms and your observations are potentially helping real researchers grow their data sets. It's good stuff. I, uh, I highly recommend iNaturalist. Yeah. It's like Nature Bingo, kind of, yeah. Yeah. And you're installing it on your phone now? It's awesome, Jaded Fair. You're really gonna like it. Yeah. And Red Banshee says, I've been going outside and looking up rather than looking down these days. Ah, for Thursday Bird's Day, perhaps? That's another great thing, is that if you're already taking photos for Thursday Bird's Day, each one of those you can add to iNaturalist. And you can grow your list of observations like that. It's super cool. Yeah. Um, oh, and astronomy spring semester. Okay, okay, cool. And does it need a roaming internet connection? So I use it without data. So I, I don't, I usually have data turned off on my phone. The thing is, you can take an observation, you can take a photograph and everything, and it'll just hold it until the next time you have Wi-Fi, and then you can upload all of them when you have Wi-Fi. So that's what I do. Because I don't like, I never have data turned on on my phone. It's just a waste. I don't need it, you know? So yeah, yeah. Um, the good stuff, iNaturalist. Anyway, let's get back to our... It's snakes. Look at beauty. Okay, that's a good place for you. Between the leaves of this bromeliad is this beautiful snake. Okay, I'm gonna be quiet because I need to concentrate. These vipers are very small and very quick, so they're very tricky to catch. Mm. Oh my gosh. Woo woo! You're feisty. <laughs> You're feisty. So the problem that. with vipers is that they, by nature, when left alone, you know, like to mind their own business. But when they're pressed or when they feel threatened, they are quick to struggle, quick to strike. And I don't want to be bit by the snake, but I also don't want the snake to injure himself. Okay, and he could do that. He could easily puncture his own flesh with those two very large fangs to the front of his mouth. I'm 
using my fingers, I've got my thumb and middle finger on either side yeah, of the jaw. Yeah, he knows what he's doing there. I've got my index finger supporting his head, but he's really moving around a lot. I'm afraid he's going to injure himself. So I'm going to let him go, and that's okay, because there's another snake right behind you. By the way, I'm describing <laughs> how I'm holding the snake. That by no means is instruction for you to go capture your own snake. Yeah, don't try this at home. Do not go picking up vipers like that. Go. Right behind you, another one. Come here. When they told us that this island was crawling with snakes, to be honest, I really didn't believe them. But there were snakes, and they were everywhere. Look at that. Very cool. So he's got a special, like, articulating snake stick right there. One that's actually got, like, a hinge on it. That's pretty neat. I'm now holding him very gently. He's tasting you with his tongue. What's it like to be a snake? With those tongues tasting the world. Oh, see how he rattles his tail like. Well, well, well. Hogan. You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this. Hogan, thank you for the raid. And welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. And uh, how did your stream go? Oh, gonna help it was really good. Sweetie Pie. Hey. Hey. Come up here. Look, I got treats for you. Hey. Oh, look at that. Oh, you can't eat it yet. It's up here. It's up here. You know where to get it, sweetie. It'd be wonderful if we had all three cats on today's stream. That would be a new record. We already had Moon Pie. Sweetie Pie might be here in a moment. In fact... Come here, sweetie. Come on up here. Oh, she was just... Just coiling up. To be able to, to join us. And there she is. Oh, hang on. Webcam is malfunctioning again. Rather, that's OBS malfunctioning. Oh, come on. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. OBS issues. Don't crash on me. Don't crash. No! There we go. Okay, we're back. We're back. Uh, hopefully you can see and hear me. Sorry, OBS just crashed on me. Oh, and there she goes. Well. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're good. OBS just crashed. Yeah. iOS was just checking on me for a second. Um. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That was Sweetie Pie right there, Pimp Cat. There's three cats who live here. You already saw Moon Pie, who has appeared for the very first time on today's stream. That was Sweetie Pie. Maybe we'll get Mini Pie also. Rabidwina says new place? I mean, yes. I moved here at the beginning of December, Rabidwina, and there's cats who lived here before I did. I'm very lucky that they've accepted me into their ranks. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Which one is Minnie? Uh, she's the black cat, Pimp Cat. <laughs> she, she's the one with four legs and one tail. <laughs> oh, she's all black. Moon Pie has got a little bit of cream filling right here on her chest. Sweetie Pie has got white socks and a white spot on her nose. You just saw Sweetie a minute ago. Yeah. That emotes when? Hopefully soon, Madam33. Hopefully soon. I've got a lot of other stuff on my plate right now, but it's it's on the to-do list. Yeah. Do they not all... F no, they do, Sparky Pogosh. That was the joke. They all have four legs. Anyway. Creatures that do not have four legs are, of course... Um, let's 
serpientes. Los snakes. Like that? He ain't saying dinner time. That's no dinner bell. That is a, a warning. And what's interesting is that there is a viper related to the snake, which has taken that warning step even further. And that a is to have a I can draw. I can draw. Its tail. But this snake yeah. doesn't have a rattle. What it would rely on are the leaves and sticks around that tail, which will make a, a flickering sound when he feels alarmed. Yeah. Double here snake sticks here. Wow. You precious, precious snake. Pretty cool. My trip to Ecuador was just the opposite of my experience in Brazil. The snakes weren't in the trees. And I appreciate I that, Claire. Any, Thank you. Anywhere. And then, when I finally did find one, I was just coming across this path, and suddenly, this very cantankerous serpent has appeared. There. What are you? Come here, oh boy! Look at you, beautiful snake. Man, look at the colors on him. <laughs> Snake escape. Man, I've never seen a cat eyed snake move that fast. Wow. And there he goes. Come oh, on. The cat eyed snake got away. But you know what? Later I found Bye -bye, snake. a treasure. Yeah. in front of me you can see a spectacular looking snake Ooh, look at that is that that's the one with the with the nose on it that's a green schnoz snake or that's not the real name what is it called come down from the canopy tomato worm green vine snake beautiful vine snake Look at that. While traveling in places like India and Southeast Asia, I have captured snakes that look just like this one right snake. Here. See, it's Emily knows what's up. Convergence is when two species in two different parts of the world evolve similar survival skills or adaptations to meet the challenges of the environment. They come yeah. from unique origins. They don't share a similar genetic or biological path. But what they share in common is they survive the same way, whether yeah. that's eating a particular resource or avoiding a predator. But the way they're surviving is similar. Very cool. Very cool. Not bite my fingers, and we will release him. And there he goes. <laughs> well, there Lovely. Go. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. It just hangs out there. You could walk by. And never know that this was attached to a two-meter snake. You'd think it was the extension of a vine or the tendril of a philodendron, but it is a wonderful <laughs> snake. Great stuff, Ecuador, isn't it? Super cool. Hope you're having fun. I picked the most inaccessible part of Panama to go snake hunting in. An area called the Darien. No roads to get there. Yet yeah, the Darien Gap. But it was there that I found one of the most amazing-looking snakes I've ever seen. Look what's moving across this wheel. It is a spectacular snake. That's some kind of this viper, an venomous. Viper. And yeah. Although they're not particularly aggressive, they are very, very venomous. Wow. <gasps> In the time of the dinosaur, this was a subtropical delta. Rilesy. Home of the big plant eaters and of the monsters who chased them. Ooh, Rilesy does a lot of that chasing, huh? And has been doing for six months. Thank you, thank you, Rilesy, for your ongoing support. I really appreciate that. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Thank you for keeping me here on the air, Rilesy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I forgot they've got a very good reach. This is why you have to be so careful, you know? When you're working with venomous snakes, if you screw up, you can be dead. And you can't blame the snake. It's very easy yep. to blame the snake. There we go. Oh, my gosh. You know, I could I could show you some videos of, like, American religious groups doing snake handling. 
And like, I don't know, if this were a if we were less focused on science outreach and education, then that's what I would be doing, because that's content on Twitch, right? I'm not gonna do that just because it's sad and dumb and we can focus on cooler things, but we'll actually learn something. So uh let's continue with this, you know? Look right above his eyes, you can see yeah. the of and he says, No, that stuff's the worst. Beautiful yeah. snake. Yeah. Hence the term eyelash viper, not because it has hair. Reptiles don't have hair, they have scales. Okay? And look at the camouflage. These are the prettiest vipers you will find in the new world. Huh. And they come in all sorts of colors. You can get them orange, you can get them yellow, you can get them green. This one is cinnamon. And if you think those bands and of Gene Wen, you're right about that. That's why we're not watching that. Colored scales yeah. and the top of its body are beautiful. Look at its belly. And there you go, CF, yes. What a beautiful snake. Welcome, okay. CF. It's good to have you here. How much of an aphidiophobiac you are, how much of an unnatural fear of snake is coiled up in your body, you can't help but to look at this creature, whether you like him or don't like him. Yeah. You see a beautiful animal, brilliant coloration with eyelashes. Eyelashes not of hair, but of scales. Pretty cool. Uh, what, a, what a lovely way to, to end that video there, too. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, really lovely. So that is Jeff Corwin right there with his Snicktacular special. Hey, we'll watch one more with the Black Mamba here, and then we'll go on to the origin of snakes and uh, how we can trace the evolution of these critters from their lizardy ancestors. A perfect way to bring the wonders and the beauties of Africa home. Maybe one of the most dangerous snakes in the world. Serpent. Seldom have I ever run across a serpent as fearless as this one. You might be able to tell that I'm just a little bit nervous here. Oh yeah. They've got very potent venom and they are very fast and aggressive. They're good at defending themselves, these guys. Oh man, look at this. Look at this. I am in seventh heaven right now. For herpetologists to see this creature face to face like this, it doesn't get any better than this. Because you know what this is. This is Dendro Aspis, or the Black Mamba. When you first think of the Mamba, Close you caption. think of dangerous, cruel, ornery, and ugly, like the Namibian desert. But in fact, it's a spectacular creature. When respected, Beautiful. it's a creature which really brings home the beauty the magnificence yeah. of Africa. This creature goes lightning fast. His strike is nothing but a blur. And what all the lapids share in common is that they, lapids is the, the part, that's that family there. Um, was it lapidae? I think. Here, um, black mamba. There we go. Yeah, there you are right there. Dendroaspis polylepis. Like Jeff Corwin was saying there. And these are part of, what, Lapidae, right? Cobras and their relatives? Um, oh boy. I guess they, we don't actually have clade names here, but whatever. Anyway, um, yeah. Cast Dreamer says, I feel bad for all these snakes. I mean, the snakes aren't being hurt. They might be a little bit stressed out here, but the kind of work that Jeff Corwin is doing here is super, super important. I mean, snakes are just detested by most people. Like, maybe not most people, but so many people around the world hate snakes. They are terrified of snakes. They would like nothing more than to just wipe out all the snakes in the whole world and that's a ghoulish you know prospect that's that's like a horrible thing to even think people are horrible to snakes and these are just other creatures that you know share our planet with us they are deserving of our respect they are beautiful and by showing people these animals like this People like Jeff Corwin are able to hopefully change people's hearts and minds a little bit. They go, holy cow, this is 
very dangerous animal. If you provoke it, if you mess with it, if you try and hurt it, it will defend itself. And it might hurt you even worse. Um, but that's really cool and interesting, honestly. Like, that's that's fascinating. That's super cool. Worthy of our respect and our admiration. I mean, huge respect to venomous snakes. They are supremely well adapted to their environments, and they are... They might be a very different creature from us, but that's so cool, you know? So he's he's doing good work here, you know? Have fixed yeah. fangs, okay? Fixed fangs. The mamba's a little different, though, okay? The mamba has more control over his fangs, okay? So huh. as I talk to you and explain the natural history of this creature... I have to really watch what I'm doing. I can't get lost in conversation because before you know it, I'm talking to you about mambas. He sneaks out about two inches out of my grasp and then boom, he lands me with a very powerful bite and then I'm in trouble, serious trouble. This is one of the most dangerous snakes in the world when not respected. Yeah. The venom in this snake is potent. It is a neurotoxin, a venom which is ultimately designed to shut down the nervous system of both predator and prey. If this yeah. creature were to land... Elapidae. Thank you, Sparky Pogosh. Yeah. Anywhere from a half an hour the to four hours to start receiving antivenom. If you don't get the antivenom, you're going to die if you're bit by this snake. What I'm going to wow. do is carefully unwrap him. I want to end this on a high note. we got lots of places to go in this world. So I'm going to be very, very careful. <laughs> and then I am going to see you over there right now. <laughs> Look at that snake. Holy cow. Yeah. Um. Let's take a look at... At the origin of snakes for a minute. Because while we have a good idea of when snakes evolved... We don't necessarily have the best idea of sort of where and, and how snakes first evolved. The fossil record gives us wonderful examples of leggy snakes like this. They've still got, you know, little limbs. Because we know that snakes evolved from earlier lizard ancestors. Snakes, therefore, are a kind of lizard. They are part of the group Squamata. So, uh... There we go. Lizards and snakes. Snakes, strictly speaking, are a kind of lizard. Because they evolved from a lizard ancestor. A squamate. Right there. Lizards and snakes. There we go. Unidentata. Episquamata. And then we get to snakes right here. Serpentes. They are a kind of lizard that lost their legs. Um... And Sparky Pog just says, I wonder why they lost their legs. There's two main hypotheses for this. It's still a mystery. It's still a matter of debate. This past summer, when I was in Wyoming, digging up dinosaurs, and Nick Longrich was on our crew, he and I had a long conversation about the origin of snakes, because this is something that he works on, too. There's two major hypotheses for how and where snakes first evolved. The first hypothesis is that snakes evolved from marine animals. Where the lizards that evolved into snakes, the idea is that they were marine. They, they evolved to live in the ocean first. And in the ocean, you don't really need your limbs as much. So they just became longer and skinnier, longer and snakier, and lost their limbs. Because it helped them move through the water. And then later, some of them came back onto land. That's the oceanic hypothesis, or the marine hypothesis for the origin of snakes. Hypothesis number two is that snakes evolved from fossorial ancestors. Does anybody know what the word fossorial means? Anybody? Fossorial. What do you think, chat? Almost sounds like fossil, doesn't it? Fossorial. Yeah, you spelled it right, Barnacle Bum. Not like a dry cereal, Tommy Platicus. 
If you said something like digging or burrowing or being underground, subterranean, then you are correct. Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, did snakes first evolve as marine animals in the ocean or did they first evolve as digging, burrowing, underground animals? It's still a big debate among paleontologists. And this video is all about that. Check it out. 90 million years ago, a stealthy predator slipped in and out of burrows that it dug in the shadows of the dinosaurs in what would later become Argentina. Today, this yeah. creature is known as Najash, named after a monstrous biblical snake. And for the most part, it had all the classic traits that you expect a snake to have, like a long, sinuous body and ribs for days. But this ancient snake also had legs, which sounds weird, right? Like a snake with limbs? But what's even stranger about this creature is, we are not at all sure where it came from. <laughs> yeah. Okay, first, let me answer. And so, yeah, chat, not like it matters right now, but do we want to have a poll? Let's run a poll real quick. Before we watch this video. Here we go. Let's start up a poll. Yeah. Let's see. Snake origins? Let's see. Fossorial? Digging? Or... Marine? Aquatic? What do you think, chat? We're just gonna run a quick one-minute poll. And, uh, you know, this isn't really based on anything yet. This is just based on vibes, I guess, right now. But what do you think? You know? Yeah. Let's view those results. And, uh, Marine is winning out so far. Interesting. Yeah. You think both? Well, I mean... It kind of has to be one or the other for, like, the ancestral species of snakes. It, it really can't be both. Or at least it, it, like, it's very, very unlikely that it would be both. You know? And I'm, I'm surprised at how, like, even this is. Unless they're polyphyletic, which we don't think they are, Sloppy Salamander, yeah. And marine aquatic is one with fifty six percent. That's not a, that's not a huge majority of the vote. So yeah, yeah. And snakes today do 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 both digging and swimming. Yeah, we've got certain species that spend most of their time underground, and we've got certain species like sea snakes that spend literally almost all of their time in the ocean. They only come on the land to like lay their eggs, right? Yeah. And Barnacle Bum says worms, both marine and land, seem well adapted to burrowing. And it's tricky because of that. You know? If you don't got limbs, then there's like... It becomes difficult to determine like what in the world you're doing. You know? Yeah. So. Let's talk about it. It came from... Okay, first, let me answer the question that's probably on your mind already. Yes, Najash is considered a true snake, even though it had legs. Two of them toward the back of its body. It's one of the earliest yep. known snakes in the fossil record found with limbs intact, but it was by no means the only one. Snakes with legs have been described in such disparate places as Great Britain, Morocco, Romania, and Wyoming. Some of these reptiles, yep. like Najash, had two legs, others might have had four, but most of them are known from only a few bones, a piece of a jaw here and a vertebra there. And because of this, the evolutionary history of snakes is among the most mysterious of all the vertebrates. Biologists 
scientists know that snakes diverged from lizards probably as early as the Jurassic period, around 200 million years ago, and eventually radiated early? the 3,000 species we have today. But we don't really know why. I thought they were early Cretaceous in origin. Well, colored me corrected there. Snakes might be almost as old as birds then. As a group. Which group of lizards gave rise to the snakes, or when or why they lost their legs in the first place? We can't answer these huh. questions because we don't have enough data. Most of the very oldest snake fossils that have been found are just fragments. But we do have a couple of good, if competing, theories about where snakes came from. Some scientists think that the first snakes descended from burrowing lizards. Others think they might have come from lizards that swam in the open ocean. That's because yeah. the way that snakes... Now this is maybe one of the hypotheses for, like, lizards, uh... Others think for how mosasaurs first evolved too, um, is that they were like they evolved from some sort of varanid-like lizard that spent more and more and more time in the water until they just eventually became fully marine, fully committed to life in the seas. I think they might have come from lizards that swam in the open ocean. That's because the yeah. way that snakes move seems to work best for either burrowing through soil like a worm does, or propelling through water as eels do. So let's start with that. And I feel like both of these critters were brought up by members of chat right here. Actually, I'm not totally sure anybody brought up eels, but worms are fossorial, clearly. But there are also marine worms as well. Yeah. For either burrowing through soil like a worm does, or propelling through water as eels do. So let's start with that. The consensus is that snakes came eels from lizards. Eels were mentioned. Nice. Yeah, where you said does eels. one animal stop and the Bulls other bracket. one start? Like, what is the difference between a snake with legs and a lizard? Well, that's a great question. What is the difference between a snake with legs? And a lizard. Well, it. The way that we would actually classify this. You can still have legs and be a snake. You just have to be the common ancestor of all the snakes. That's how classification works in, in science. When we're classifying living things, it's based on your ancestry. So it's not all arbitrary, spark, spark, sloppy salamander. No, no. It, it would be based on the phylogeny. So, like. The ancestor of all modern snakes would be the first snake. Does that make sense? Kind of like how the ancestor of all the dinosaurs would be the first dinosaur. It's not arbitrary in that sense. Like, it goes back to common ancestry. So yeah, and which species of snake has legs? Um, well, we've got snake species that have remnants of their legs today, but not full legs. But we've got fossil examples of snakes with legs. So let's get into that. Well, most of us would yeah. identify a snake by its long, slinky body, but herpetologists actually define snakes not by their slinkiness, but by their mouthiness. Specifically, yeah. snakes are identified by adaptations in their there skulls you go, that allow... Iacane, how are you doing? Welcome back to Paleontologizing. I hope things are good with you. Good to see you, Iacane. Yeah. them to unhinge their jaws. For example, several parts of a snake's skull are smaller than they are in other reptiles, and its two lower jaw bones aren't fused together like they are in other vertebrates. Instead, <laughs> snakes just have a little cartilage there. These adaptations work together to provide maximum flexibility so snakes can swallow things bigger than their own heads, which we do not recommend that you try at home because you can't do that. Snakes are also yeah. unique in that they don't have ears. No ear holes, no eardrums, no inner ear bone that other reptiles have. And he's totally right about this. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this was the reason why, as a, like, 9 or 10-year-old child, I stopped reading the Harry Potter books. I got so mad. Um, I just devoured the first book in, like, a day or two. I read through it so quickly and I really enjoyed it. And then I was tearing into the second book and like really kind of really getting into it. Like, oh wow, I'm going to read this whole book series. This is going to be great. And I got to the end of the second book where Harry is fighting this like giant snake. The author talks about how it's a snake and blah blah blah, blah snake. And then he already my 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 heckles are up a little bit and I'm like, "Oh boy." This is going to be one of those situations again, isn't it? Where the reptile has to be the villain in the story. You know? I'm so sick of this trope, where the reptile always has to be the bad guy. You know, uh, people have such hatred and vitriol for reptiles. Like, I'm so tired of this. 
And then, of course, Harry, like, I think he takes a sword and he, like, pokes the eyes out of the snake. Like, that's not a kind way to treat snakes. Oh, I don't like this. But then it's blind, but then it's listening for him with its ears. And the author writes that, like, oh, it's listening for him with its ears so that it can, you know, do its murderous reptilian thing and eat him. And, you know, because it is, it's just a monster after all, you know? And I specifically remember just clapping the book closed right then and just saying out loud to myself, snakes don't have ears. I don't have to keep reading this. And I didn't. And I never read any other other Harry Potter books. I went back to nonfiction after that, you know? Um. So, yeah. Yeah. Lordy says, it's symbolic, Danny. Nah, it was pretty literal. I don't know. Uh, I was just really put off mostly by how the reptiles always gotta be the villain, you know? So tired of that. So tired of that. Reptiles get such a bad rap, and I'm just... I don't know. So I guess I was fed up with the author of the Harry Potter books decades before it was cool. You know? <laughs> Let's continue. I recommend that you try at home because you can't do that. Snakes are also uh. unique in that they don't have ears. No ear holes, no eardrums, no inner ear bone that other reptiles have. Instead, what was once their ear bone became fused to their jaw where it allows snakes to detect vibrations in the ground. So you would think that knowing all this would help us. And Ikean says it was also a basilisk, not necessarily a snake. I think it's referred to as a snake in the book. Again, it's been decades since I've read it, but um. But a basilisk is actually a different type of squamate, which is really cool. And now I have an opportunity to tell you about that. So let's do that. Uh, so the basilisk lizard is sometimes called the Jesus lizard. And it is super, super cool. They can literally run on water. Take a look at this. They're very profane. No. Oh, boy. Give us this day our daily dragonflies. Oh, there's a snaky boy. There you go, Iacan, yeah. No, Mosasaurs are not dinosaurs, though. Look at that. Look at this. Look at this. Hang on. I want to I wanna fully emphasize how cool this is. This is a lizard that can literally run on water. Check that out. Yeah. Pretty awesome. <laughs> Sometimes snakes just want to show, you know? Yeah. That's a basilisk right there. Let me know if that's the first time you've ever seen that critter, because if it is, I'll, I'll be very happy, actually, having introduced this to you. But what a cool critter is that. A basilisk lizard. Holy Basilisk moly. Basilisk lizards may be more well known as Jesus Christ lizards because of their uncanny ability to run across the surfaces of rivers and streams. Yeah. Or because seeing this occur may cause the observer to shout, Jesus Christ! in surprise. 
<laughs> All four basilisk lizard species are able to perform this holy act, though the physics behind it holds water. Basilisk lizards uh... have flaps of rolled up scales on their toes that unfurl when they hit the waves. As they run, their huge feet slam against the water's surface and create a pocket of air on which the lizard can stay atop and That's out of the so water. That's so cool. While running on water, they can cover an average of 15 feet before gravity takes over and they begin to sink. Though juveniles are known to run further thanks to their lighter weight. That Makes sinking sense. Ontogeny. can stop these lizards though, as they're excellent swimmers. Plus, they're able to run on water almost as fast as they are able to run on land. On land, they can run on four legs, or upright on two like the frilled neck lizards we previously discussed. Basilisk yeah. lizards run a lot because they're skittish. Considering their predators include birds of prey and snakes, it makes sense that they're hypervigilant. They have to watch out when they hit the water, too, because they can also be taken by crocodiles. Most mm. basilisk lizards spend their time hanging out on the banks of bodies of water, usually in trees and shrubs. Though the oddballs, the striped basilisks, may stray further away from water and spend more time on the ground than their conspecifics. Every family has a striped basilisk, am I right? Though they can reach lengths of more than two feet, a large portion of this is attributed to their whip-like tails. Heck, whip-like isn't even accurate. They legit use their tails as whips to fend off predators if walking on water doesn't surprise them enough. Yep. Jesus Christ! Female basilisk lizards are typically Goodness. smaller than males, and while they might sport a small hood, the girls tend to lack the distinct crests and sails found adorning the male's yeah. garments. These crests and sails are used to impress the local ladies. Competition Pretty cool. for females is fierce in the basilisk lizard world, and although males are typically ready to begin breeding... So this is actually... I, I saw a talk about this at the Museum of Paleontology a few months ago. They have what we call hyper-elongate neural spines, or HENs for short. So sort of like Spinosaurus. Um, you know, they've got these really, really long neural spines that come off of the vertebrae like that, and these guys, they actually seem to form a sail. You know, kind of similar to, like, uh, a pelicosaurus, for instance. Pelicosaurus. Those synapsid uh, mammal relatives here. Like our edaphosaurus right here. It's a lot more dramatic in edaphosaurus or dimetrodon. But these guys are pretty impressive, too, you know? Yeah. That sail is impressing you, Cast the Dreamer? It works, doesn't it? Yeah, very impressive. And to lack the distinct crests and sails found adorning the male's bodies. These crests and sails are used to impress the local ladies. Competition for females is fierce in the basilisk lizard world, and although males are typically ready to begin breeding by the age of two, it often takes a few more years before they're able to acquire and defend their own territory. Like the chuckwallas we've talked about previously, a male basilisk lizard will breed with the females in his territory throughout the year, and the females will lay <laughs> <in> <laughs> clutches of about 10 eggs that incubate in burrows for two to three months. The babies are on their own from birth, but when you can walk on water, do you really need a parent to guide you? Jesus! It also helps that basilisk lizards eat base- <laughs> This video. BB Green says, I would like to know your thoughts on the new no- No? Nov? N-O-V? Oh, you don't mean the new PPS Nova documentary, do you? Um, I haven't seen it yet, but some of my friends are very excited about it. Yeah, we will probably have to watch that next week. Um, yeah, a friend of mine uh, did the illustrations of, uh, of that primitive whale. We were just talking about whale evolution yesterday, so it's very relevant. Maybe we'll find a, a trailer and watch that after this. But um, yeah, yeah, I've not seen it yet. I'm excited to watch it. And I have friends and colleagues who might actually appear in that documentary. We'll have to see. But yeah, anyway, welcome, VB Green. Good to have you here. Yeah. Basically anything they can catch. Insects are an obvious food of choice, but they'll also take crabs, shrimp, fish, bats, birds, other lizards, fruit, flowers, the list goes on. Basilisk huh. lizards can be found in Central and Northern South America, though they've been introduced to Florida. On average, basilisk oh, lizards live about Florida five too. years in the wild. 
For You're more right facts there, Hiptacular the Raptor. Wizards, check out the links in the description. Get cool stuff. Here's a link to that video right there. Yeah, not a fussy eater then. Yeah, there you go. Um, anyway. So yeah, snakes. Back to snake. Well, before we get back to snakes, let's maybe see if we, uh, if we can find a trailer for that PBS Nova... documentary uh when whales could walk preview oh very cool take a look at this in the sahara desert fossils are everywhere telling you what life looked like 40 million years ago an incredible discovery we have a complete skeleton may reveal the origins of the prehistoric whale that lived here long time ago of very the world's cool. largest mammals this is so awesome they're doing everything mammals do but in the water when whales could walk on Nova. Good Wednesday stuff. At eight. Well, the whole thing is up on YouTube. Um, merp. There we go. Yeah. So we will watch this maybe tomorrow. In the sands of the Egyptian. Oh well, no, we're gonna be talking mostly about rodents tomorrow because it's Groundhog Day. But maybe we'll get to whales too. I don't know. We'll see. Desert. Experts are uncovering clues to a lost past. Look yeah. at this, right here. From a time long before the pharaohs, when this place was underwater, and whales had legs? Yep. Here's the hind limb of this beast. So, yeah, whales used to have legs. And so did snakes. Uh, here is a link to this video. We'll watch this at some point. Maybe next Tuesday? We'll see. Um, on uh, Well, tomorrow we're going to be talking about rodents for Groundhog Day. And we'll be talking about when uh, when some rodents used to be the size of a bear. Critters like Amblerizo. The Caribbean. We'll we'll talk about those critters tomorrow, and we'll talk about groundhogs and everything else. Um. Then on Monday, shoot, I almost forgot to. I did forget to update it. Let's go ahead and uh, be gone. January. We're on to February now. Today we're talking about snakes. Tomorrow we're going to talk about. Uh, yeah. Groundhog Day. Discussing the... No, let's do... Celebrating. Uh... Fossil history. And current biology. Of rodents. Yeah. And then Monday... I just confirmed with Ethan Cowgill this morning. Um, paleontologist interview with Ethan Cowgill of the Utah Geological Survey. And a good friend, colleague, and crewmate of mine. We're going to be doing the very first of our paleontologist interviews for this next year, for this year, 2024, with Ethan Cowgill. That's going to be a ton of fun. And then maybe we'll do whales on Tuesday. We'll see. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah. And Dr. Irrefutable says, do you know if Ethan is planning on crowdfunding this year's digs? I gotta talk to him about that. It looks like he might have some grant money. We might also have some, uh, some funding from a very generous individual benefactor. So we'll see. 
We'll see. Good question there. Yeah. Anyway, we'll be talking about our field work last summer in Utah, and especially in Wyoming. Ethan will give us an update on where those fossils are, currently the ones that we dug up, what the progress is on cleaning them, preparing them, studying them, and then we'll be talking about what our plans are for this next summer as we continue to explore the late Cretaceous Almond Formation of Wyoming and all of its brand new dinosaurs. There have been no dinosaurs named from that formation. Chances are anything and everything that we find there is going to be new and publishable. So we'll be talking about that too. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, good stuff. Anywho, let's get back to our sneaky friends. Shall we? Uh, and then, yeah, before too long, we get in, gotta get into Thursday birthday, too. That they don't have ears. No ear holes, no eardrums, no inner ear. And w suddenly, all of these are rever have reverted to, uh, goodness, here. Subtitles, options, why, why did it go gray? Font color, white. Yellow, white. Video override. off that's really weird they all went gray let's try and refresh and the search for dinosaur bones begins in a place like this Sanaton underscore sepa search has succeeded with their three co-explorers Sanaton sepa how are you doing welcome to paleontologizing how are you it's good to have you here thank you for joining us welcome to paleontologizing how did your stream go? Tell me about it. And it's good to have you here. Yeah. Um. Howdy, howdy. And System28, how are you doing? Look at all those chickens. Thank you for the follow as well. How are you? Happy National Serpent Day to all of you. We're talking about snakes. We've been kind of talking a little bit about how cool snakes are, how unfortunate it is that many people are afraid of snakes. Now we're talking about the fossil origin of snakes and how we can determine how this wonderful group of animals first evolved. And there's a big mystery for snakes. How did they originate? Did they first evolve on land? by burrowing and losing their limbs that way? Or did they evolve in the oceans, losing their limbs swimming through the water? Were they marine or were they fossorial? The ancestors of our modern snakes. That's what this video is about. And I'm gonna try and, let's see, options, window opacity, I don't know, we're just getting a weird... It's just being buggy right now, but that's okay. Um... Yeah. Already, yes, Najash is considered a true snake, even though it had legs. Two of them toward the back of its body. It's one of the earliest yeah. known snakes in the fossil and record. Thank you, system. With limbs yeah. intact. Oh, and shoot, before I... For those of you who are new here, let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. As a dinosaur paleontologist, I study dinosaur fossils. I publish on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs during the summers. And uh, my mission here on Twitch is to try and bring fossil science to you, to demystify it, to show you how it works, to answer your questions, to kind of walk you through what paleontology is all about, why it's important, why it's relevant to your everyday life, how it can give you cool perspectives that you wouldn't otherwise have. We would not understand snakes today to the extent that we do if it were not for 
studying fossil snakes. We wouldn't have a keen understanding of, of where snakes came from hadn't been for studying fossil snakes. So today's topic is a good example of that. You know? Yeah, and science streams, I, I appreciate you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. What are the odds that birds are polyphyletic? Um, pretty much zero, Salamander. Birds basically can't be polyphyletic because if it turns out they evolved from two different groups of dinosaurs, then we would just classify those two different groups of dinosaurs as birds. And that would be how we would solve that problem. So birds kind of, by definition, can't be polyphyletic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Let's continue with this but video. by no means the only yeah. one. Snakes with legs have been described in such disparate places as Great Britain, Morocco, Romania, and Wyoming. Some of these reptiles, yeah. like Najash, had Good two old legs. Wyoming. Others might have had four, but most of them are known from only a few bones, a piece of a jaw here and a vertebra there. And because of this, the evolutionary history of snakes is among the most mysterious of all the vertebrates. Biologists know that snakes diverged from lizards probably as early as the Jurassic period, around 200 million years. <laughs> years ago and eventually radiated into the 3,000 species we have today. But we don't really know which group of lizards gave rise to the snakes or when or why they lost their legs in the first place. We can't answer huh. these questions because we don't have enough data. Most of the very oldest snake fossils that have been found are just fragments. But we do have a couple of good, if competing, theories about where snakes came from. Some scientists think that the first snakes descended from burrowing lizards. Others think they might have come from lizards that swam in the open ocean. And this is a still a, a big ongoing debate. Were snakes originally burrowers or swimmers? That's what we're talking about here. That's because the way that snakes move seems to work best for either burrowing through soil, like a worm a, does, a or propelling through water. Australia is famous for snakes. So let's start with that. The consensus yeah. is that snakes came from lizards, but where does one animal stop and the other one start? Like, what is the difference between a snake with legs and a lizard? Well, most of us would identify a snake by its long, slinky body, but herpetologists actually define snakes not by their slinkiness, but by their mouthiness. Yeah, and this is a really good point, because there are critters today slithering around Like this. You might think, oh wow, two snakes together? That's crazy. Wrong. This is even crazier than that. That's not a snake. These are not snakes. These are basically legless lizards. These are yeah. glass lizards. And what's wild about glass lizards is that they basically look and move exactly like a snake. And people in chat already know, some of you already know, tell me. How do you tell at a glance that this is a legless lizard and not a snake? Yeah. How do you know? And Mark Melvin, yeah, they are cool. Slow worms are a kind of legless lizard. Yeah. Tongue, ear holes, and eyelids. The head, his mouth. It has a lizard face. Ears, eyelids. Yes, indeed. Very good, chat. Very, very good. You check their driver's license. Or by the closed captions, the vibes. I can accept some of those answers. Sure. Yeah. They have no legs, but there's two key ways you can tell that these are lizards and not snakes. First off, they have kind of a blockier, more sturdy pattern, and their scales are quite different, especially around their yeah. head, if you get a close enough look. That's but true. But the other thing, they can blink their eyes, because unlike yep. snakes, lizards have eyelids. What's really weird... So, oh, and that's like, as a, you know, as a paleontologist, as an evolutionary biologist... I would have worded that differently. Snakes are a kind of lizard. Because snakes evolved from a lizard ancestor, therefore snakes are a kind of lizard. But lizards that are not snakes can blink their eyes. Um, snakes do not have movable eyelids. But these guys, the legless lizards, do. Weird about this situation right now is that there's not one, but there's two. Why are they together? Well, this makes us think kind of like a scientist. 
why would these two non-social creatures be together? My theory is love is in the air. There's something mm. else really cool about these glass lizards though. Check out the tail. See that little nub? Glass lizards have the ability to drop their tails when predators threaten them. Yeah. What happens is a predator will try to bite, 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 and this all basically looks like a tail, but they'll drop the end, and the end of the tail will wiggle around while the rest of the glass lizard runs free. It's a great form of defense. The road we're on kind of cuts right through prime habitat, and that brings up a conservation point. One of the leading threats to a lot of reptile populations are roads. Because, yeah. think about it, the sun is beating down on these roads. These are ectothermic or cold-blooded creatures that need heat to basically move and survive. They lay out on roads, they don't know it's a road. Car comes by, hits them. You see dead on road reptiles all the time. So it's yep. something important to consider. Where we put our roads and how we design our roads really impacts reptile populations. But for now, let's not think about the problems. Let's just think about how cool these creatures are. Yeah, and so look at that little lizardy face right there. Yeah, so these guys evolved from lizards with legs much more recently than snakes did. Snakes also evolved from lizards with legs, but that was a long, long time ago. They've had a long time to evolve to be much more snaky. And these guys are still kind of new at that. They've got those external ears. They've got those blinking eyelids. Um, they've got a very lizardy kind of head right here, almost like like, a, like the head of a skink. So yeah, and the point that he made about roads is an important one. I was showing this earlier to chat. This is my snake stick. I usually keep this in the car, especially when I'm going out to the field. And if I ever encounter a snake in the road that's still alive, I'll pick it up with this and carry it elsewhere so it doesn't get run over. Also, if a snake happens to slither into camp, I can, uh, even if it's a venomous snake. If it's a garter snake or something, I'll just pick it up by hand. But a venomous snake, like a rattler, I'll pick up with this just to be safe and go relocate it. So I'm safe and the snake is safe and everybody else in camp is safe too. So yeah, good stuff. Um, so yeah, so how do we determine what is a snake and what is not? Ecologists actually define snakes not by their slinkiness, but by their mouthiness. Specifically, yeah. snakes are identified by adaptations in their skulls that allow them to unhinge no their jaws. <laughs> For example, several parts of a snake's skull are smaller than they are in other reptiles, and its two lower jaw bones aren't fused together like they are in other yeah, vertebrates. Instead, snakes really just have a, have a little there. cartilage there. These adaptations work together to provide maximum flexibility so snakes can swallow things bigger than their own heads, which we do not oh, recommend. Nice. Home, they go nice. Because Bite you stick. can't do that. Snakes are also unique in that they don't have ears. No ear holes, no eardrums, no inner yep. ear bone that other reptiles have. Instead, what was once their ear bone became fused to their jaw where it allows snakes to detect vibrations in the ground. So you would think that knowing all this would help us figure out where snakes came from. We just have to find when these adaptations first appeared. But it turns out that's not easy because there's evidence that seems to support each hypothesis that snakes evolved from terrestrial lizards and that they came from aquatic lizards. Advocates of the aquatic lizard hypothesis, for example, think that snakes may actually be distant cousins of the fiercest predators of the Cretaceous seas, the mosasaurs. Mosasaurs, mosasaurs were themselves yeah. descended from land-dwelling lizards, and like snakes, they developed long bodies and jaw adaptations that allowed them to open their mouths wide for a crushing bite. And for decades, researchers looked for an evolutionary link between snakes and mosasaurs in one of the most studied snakes of the Cretaceous, a two-legged snake known as Pachyrachis. Pachyrachis was found in the name. West Bank near Ramallah. Oh, Pachyrachis. was underwater when the snake lived there 95 million years ago, and studies of its anatomy have found that it probably moved the way an eel does by whipping its tail side to side to get short bursts of speed. Some paleontologists have argued that snakes like Pachyrachis descended from mosasaurs because they share a lot of similarities in the shape of their skulls, especially around the jaw.
jaw. Plus, Pachyrachis and other aquatic snakes that have been found in Ramallah were for a long time thought to be the oldest snake fossils ever found. And if the oldest snakes were marine reptiles, then snakes must have come from the sea, right? Well, in the last 10 years <clears throat> or so, a bunch of new discoveries have shaken this idea up, as well as the whole rest of the snake family tree. Paleontologists recently described at least a half a dozen previously unknown species of ancient snakes. Many of them are even older than Pachyrachis, and most of them lived on dry land. Among these new species huh. is Najash, which lived around the same time as Pachyrachis, but many are even older. Some go back as much as 167 million years, like Eophis, which was described from Great Britain in 2015. It's now considered the oldest snake ever found, and it was terrestrial. So to some experts, the notion of snakes originating on land makes a lot more sense. For one thing, many of the classic traits that snakes have, like jawbones that pick up vibrations, seem better suited for life on the ground. And not having legs can offer a lot of advantages if you're a reptile that burrows through the dirt. After all, the skinnier you are, the skinnier your burrow can be, which makes it easier to evade predators. But what about yeah. genetics? Can molecular evidence settle the great snake debate? Well, in 2013, scientists used gene data from more than 4,000 living snake and lizard species to construct a new huh. family tree for these groups of reptiles. And the results suggest that the snake's closest relatives are probably the varanid lizards, a group that includes the monitor lizards and Komodo dragons. That might yep. sound like score one for the terrestrial hypothesis, but the problem is Komodo dragons and their kin are also thought to be the closest living relatives of the mosasaurs. So yeah. depending on how you read them, these new genetic data could support either the terrestrial hypothesis or the aquatic hypothesis, which is kind of frustrating, but also fascinating. Ultimately, all we know is that snakes came from lizards, but we don't know the details of their remarkable transformation. And we know that there were snakes before the likes of Najash, the leggy reptile from Argentina, but we don't understand which lineage of lizard they came from. So in the end, snakes pose one of the greatest evolutionary mysteries in the history of animal life. Not even modern genomics has been able to tell us how and when they became a thing. At least, yep. not yet. Interesting stuff. So this remains a mystery to this day. And there are different paleontologists who disagree vehemently about the origin of snakes. We just don't know the answer yet. And in a certain way, that's exciting. Because someday we are going to figure this out. Some person is going to going to make a discovery that that elucidates this that that solves this mystery it hasn't happened yet like this is this is a finding that's still out there waiting to be made and maybe it'll be made by some young bright person who is interested in fossils right now maybe they're watching this broadcast right now either live here on twitch or later on on YouTube when this goes up there. Who knows? It's cool to think about. And there is still mystery in this world. Absolutely, Emule. The more we learn, the more we realize there is more still yet to learn. It's one of the coolest things about science. Yeah. And Axeman says, isn't the way that snakes use their belly scales for locomotion a unique trait of snakes and one which does not assist aquatic life? That would indicate it came from a terrestrial ancestor. Well. That's the thing. Is that we also have sea snakes. Check this out. Yeah, sea snakes are so cool. They're so cool. Jeez, it's deeper than I can swim. And I got legs.
Oh, yeah. By the way, there's flying snakes, too. I'll show you those in a minute. But nobody thinks that snakes first evolved to move through the air. <laughs> That's a recent development. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. Uh... It's Salamander. Yeah. That's so cool. I mean, look at that. I want I want to rewind this part. Look at this. So their their tail is flattened from side to side. That's so cool. Sea snakes are so cool. And they're so chill for the most part. They're also extremely venomous. These are the most venomous snakes in the entire world. I think, I remember reading when I was a kid, reading a book and it, it saying very, uh, you know, with great confidence, this book was stating that the most venomous snake in the world, the snake with the most potent venom is the beaked sea snake. And uh, let me look them up. Here, beaked sea snake. It doesn't actually have a beak. It's just what it's called. Hydrophus. Uh, something something is. Let's see. Man, it's really nested in there. Hydrophus schistosus. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what kind of venom it is. We'll, we'll look up a video about these guys next. But uh, they are a kind of sea snake. And you heard that right. They're lung. They don't have two lungs. They have one, or at least they might still have two, but the, the first one is extraordinarily small to the point where it's like not even there anymore almost. They've got one long lung that extends the length of their body on the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, what? I didn't know that. That's so cool. Holy moly. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. I thought turtles were the only, uh, only reptiles that could do that, that could absorb water, or absorb oxygen through their bodies while underwater. Um, interesting. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, here, let's look up the beaked sea snake on good old Wikipedia. I'm not finding a definitive YouTube video on it. Beaked sea snake, Hydrophis schistosus. Also known as the hook-nosed sea snake, common sea snake, or Valacadian sea snake. That's a highly venomous species of sea snake common throughout the tropical Indo-Pacific. This species is implicated in more than 50% of all bites caused by sea snakes, as well as the majority of envenomings and fatalities. I remember reading that a single drop of beaked sea snake venom is enough to kill 50 grown human men. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what that book said that I read when I was a kid. And it's always stuck with me. 
Uh, the venom is made up of highly potent neurotoxins and myotoxins. Uh, up to 90% of all sea snake bites are from this snake. The vast majority of deaths from sea snake bites, yeah. Um, yeah, the average venom yield per bite is approximately 7.9 to 9 milligrams, while the lethal human dose is estimated to be 1.5 milligrams. Okay, that's not enough to kill 50 people, but whatever. Um, yeah, very cool. The reason why these critters have got such a potent bite is because they're going after fish under the water. And fish are hard to catch. And so if you don't just nab them, they're, they're very slippery. If you don't just nab them immediately, you've got to find some way to immobilize them. And so there is very, very strong selective pressure on these snakes to develop venom that is highly, highly potent. So you can just kind of barely tag a fish like that, get a little bit of venom into it, and then immediately it stops swimming so that you can grab it and eat it. Because otherwise, that fish will be gone. That venom has got to be super, super potent in order to immobilize a fish. So yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And Sanaton Seppa says, How much do you trust Wikipedia as a source? It depends very, very much on the subject matter. Um, that's the thing, is that as a dinosaur paleontologist, I, you know, I actually publish in the scientific literature. I contribute to the original literature like that. The stuff that Wikipedia uh, draws from. I only really have strong expertise in one area, and that's dinosaurs. But I have found that Wikipedia tends to be fantastic for dinosaurs. Here's an example, Falcarius, this dinosaur here. Or maybe let's find another one until we find one with a uh, Torvosaurus or Allosaurus. There's a good example. Allosaurus, this is actually a featured article on Wikipedia, which means that it is very, very well sourced, very well written. This is the creme de la creme of Wikipedia articles. Wikipedia is written by users of the website. It is edited. It's a lot more stringent than it used to be. It's actually much more difficult to make random edits to Wikipedia than it used to be. There's like a whole procedure nowadays, and most of your edits will be automatically reverted by bots nowadays. But anyway... For dinosaur science, Wikipedia is the best single online resource for information that you can get. There's nothing better than Wikipedia. Uh, unless you're going to the original scientific literature, which is what Wikipedia is, is built on here. Um, yeah, all of these uh, original scientific papers, they're cited here in this. For the Allosaurus article, we have got, oh boy, 163 different references right here, just for the Allosaurus article. I'm not an expert on sea snakes, so that article that we were looking at earlier, I don't know how good it is, but I know dinosaurs. Dinosaurs are my wheelhouse, and Wikipedia is phenomenal when it comes to information about dinosaurs. For other topics, maybe it's not as good. Maybe it's lousy for certain topics, but for dinosaurs, Wikipedia is splendid. It's excellent. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um. And isn't there a sea snake that originally from freshwater, but apparently adapted to drink freshwater from the very top of the seawater. I think that's how most sea snakes get their water oops kaboots, I think. Yeah. And Axeman says, way more accurate than old encyclopedias probably were. Oh, one million percent. Shoot. Well, let's... Here, this is a perfect example here. Let's look at Allosaurus here on Wikipedia. 
And here are the three valid species of... Well, okay, maybe four. I don't really think... Uh, whatever. I don't even know if this is a different species. But Allosaurus fragilis, Europaeus, Allosaurus gemadsoni, and Allosaurus maximus. Really, really comprehensive article here. Lots of, you know, good illustrations. Lots of sources cited for Allosaurus. Now, let's look at Encyclopedia Britannica. Let's search Allosaurus on Encyclopedia Britannica. Allosaurus, lift... Uh, uh, weighed 2 tons, grew to 10.5 meters. That's not actually true. Well, like, that's not totally correct. Uh, and that's it. This is the entire Allosaurus article from Encyclopedia Britannica. Not only is it not very comprehensive, it's also out of date. You know? Nothing about the different species of Allosaurus that have been named. I don't see any references here. Like, this is not a good source of information. If you actually want to learn everything there is to know about Allosaurus, this is not a good place to start. You know? Encyclopedia Britannica, I'm actually honestly kind of surprised that it even still exists. It has been completely subsumed by Wikipedia, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah. Senaton says, to be fair, all, all of human knowledge is made by humans, so how trusty are we? Well, that's what science is, Sanaton Seppa. Science is a way of learning about the natural world that's as rigorous as it possibly can be. It is a way of trying to account for our human biases and our human shortcomings. And try and actually get as close to the truth as humanly possible. You know? So yeah. Yeah. Um... And, and I think this is really, really important to talk about. We're going to go to a brief tangent here about the philosophy of science. Because this is important, and we haven't done this in a while. So, uh... Is science reliable? This should be a decent video. SciShow usually does really good stuff. Let's take a look. I'll skip through the intro. Yeah. In 2012, a researcher named Glenn this Begley guy again. published a commentary in the journal Nature. He <laughs> said that Hank. during his decade as the head of cancer research for Amgen, an American pharmaceutical company, he would tried to reproduce the results of 53 so-called landmark cancer studies. But his team wasn't able to replicate 47 of oh those boy. 53 studies. That means that 88% of these really important cancer studies couldn't be reproduced. Then, in August 2015, a psychologist named Brian Nosek published another paper. This this time in the journal Science. Over the course of the previous three years, he said, he'd organized repeats of 100 psychological studies. 97 of the original experiments had reported statistically significant results. That is, results that were most likely caused by variables in the experiment and not some coincidence. When his team tried to reproduce those results, they only got 36 significant results. Oh boy. A third of what the original studies had found. It seems like every few months, there's some kind of news about problems with the scientific publishing industry. A lot of people, both scientists, yeah. Yeah, and again, I'd like to emphasize that this is the publishing industry is an industry, and any time you have financial incentive to get things published like this, it's not going to be perfect. You introduce money into any equation, and it's going to mess things up, you know? 
And you talk to like any scientist around the world and they will have, they will absolutely have gripes with the publishing industry itself. It doesn't always live up to the ideals of science. Let's continue. And science enthusiasts are concerned. So why does this keep happening? And what can be done to fix the system? Right now, the scientific uh, publishing industry is going through what's there you go. Oops, called yeah. a replication yeah. or reproducibility crisis. Researchers are repeating earlier studies trying to reproduce the experiments as closely as possible. One group might publish findings that look promising, and other groups might use those results to develop their own experiments. But if the original study was wrong, that's a whole lot of time and money right down the drain. In theory, yeah. these repeat studies should be finding finding the same results as the original experiments. If a cancer drug worked in one study and a separate group repeats the study under the same conditions, the cancer drug should still work. But that's not what happened with Begley's cancer studies, and researchers in other fields have been having the same problem. They're repeating earlier studies, and they aren't getting the same results. So why are these inaccurate results getting published in the first place? Well, sometimes people really are just making things up, but that's relatively rare. Usually, yeah. it has like, actual fraud like this in science is really, really rare. It does happen. And usually we try and run those people out of science on a rail. You know? Like, we get our torches and pitchforks and we try and run them out of town. But it does still happen sometimes. You know? Um... But yeah, when that when real fraud happens, it's big news. Yeah, diagonal. Yeah, yeah. Um, at least it should be big news. It usually is. It usually is. To do with yeah. misleading research. And it's that publisher parish world. Yeah. So science streams. I'm so glad you're here, Balent, because you will have valuable valuable insight about this kind of thing. So Balent is also a publishing scientist, and um, got some thoughts about how academia works, like I do too. Oh, yeah. Research yeah. tools, the way a study is designed or the way data are interpreted. Take an example from the world of biomedicine. Researchers who work with proteins will often use antibodies to help them with research. You might know antibodies as a part of your immune system that helps target outside invaders, but in scientific research, antibodies can be used to target specific proteins. And lately, there's You're been a lot of here. evidence that these that antibodies bullet. aren't as reliable as scientists yeah. have been led to believe. Companies produce yeah. these antibodies so researchers will buy them, and they'll say in their catalog which antibodies go with which proteins and if, if, again of course you've got a financial incentive to say that these things work anytime that you put you know, like you get money involved in a process like this there's reason to be a little bit suspicious of that. The problem is, you know? those labels aren't always right. And if researchers don't check to make sure that their antibody works the way it should, they can misinterpret their results. One analysis published in 2011 in a journal called Nature Structural and Molecular Biology tested 246 of these antibodies, each of which was said to bind with just one protein. But it turned out that a quarter of them actually targeted more than one protein, and four of those actually targeted the wrong kind of protein. Researchers oh, yeah. were using this stuff to detect proteins in their experiments, but the the antibodies could have been binding with completely different materials, creating false positives and therefore flawed results. That's exactly Ugh. what happened to researchers at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto. They wasted two years and a half a million dollars using an antibody to look for a specific protein that they thought might be connected to pancreatic cancer. Then they figured out that the whole time the antibody had actually been binding to a different cancer protein and didn't Ugh. even target the protein they were looking for. So the Ugh. antibody production industry is having some quality control problems and it's affecting a lot of biomedical research. Some companies have already taken steps to try and ensure quality. One reviewed its entire catalog in 2014 and cut about and a third of the yeah, antibodies. There's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Now, researchers could yeah. try testing the antibodies themselves to make sure they only bind to the protein they're supposed to, but that's like conducting a whole separate study before they even get to start on the main project. Most research groups don't have the time or money to do that. But now that scientists are aware of the issue, they can at least be more careful about where they get their antibodies. Having accurate tools for research isn't enough, though. Part of the reproducibility crisis also has to do with how experiments are designed. This can be a problem in all kinds of different fields, but it's especially an issue in psychology, where results often depend on human experience, which can be very subjective. Experiments are supposed to be designed to control for as many external factors as possible, so you can tell if your experiment is actually what's leading to the effect. But in psychology, you can't really control for all possible external factors. Too many of them just have to do with the fact that humans are human. One classic experiment, for example, showed that when people had been exposed to words related to aging, they walked more slowly. Another research group
have tried to replicate that study <laughs> and failed. But that doesn't necessarily prove or disprove the effect. It's possible that the replication study exposed the subjects to too many aging-related words, which might have ruined the subconscious effect. Factors that huh. weren't directly related to the study could have also affected the results, like what color the room was or the day of the week. When such tiny differences can change the results of a study, it's not too surprising that when they reviewed those 100 psychology papers, no... Oh. Do you do, um, dig up, dig up dinosaurs? <laughs> Valiant cheese. Oh. Thank you for the raid. Valiant How did your stream go? Raiders want to know what it's like. Welcome, welcome, Valiant cheese. Uh, you were doing some more fossil sweeper. Excellent, Valiant cheese. Very, very cool. How'd it go? How's your game going? Valiant cheese designs and produces video games. Go check out Valiant cheese if you want to see this fossil sweeper game, which sounds really cool. Um, excellent. Fossil Sweeper is like Minesweeper, but with fossils. Confused to kid now. Go check it out. Yeah. And San Anton Seppa, I'm sorry your message got deleted there. Um, we, we try and keep the chat like PG or G rated, but you had a good question. How bad is climate change? It all depends on on if we're able to do something about it sooner rather than later. Because if we don't do something about it within the next like decade or two, oh man, are things going to be bad? Um, I'll put it this way: the greatest mass extinction event, the most horrible mass extinction event in Earth's history was at the end of the Permian period. This is the extinction event that kind of paved the way for the dinosaurs. And Daisy McGar, thank you. Hi, Beats. Happy Thursday, Bird's Day. Happy Thursday, Bird's Day to you too, Daisy McGar. Welcome, welcome. We'll get into Thursday, Bird's Day before too long here. And it's already 6 o'clock. Yeah, we'll do that soon. Um... Yeah, the, the biggest mass extinction event in Earth's history at the end of the Permian where like 90% of species died out. We're basically trying to speed run that right now. That was caused by global warming, by acidification of the oceans, by massive release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. We're doing the same, thing, same exact thing right now, except like we're doing it on a much, 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 much faster timescale. So it, it could be bad. It could be really, really bad unless we do something about it like yesterday, you know? Sanaton says, I think we passed the point already. I don't, I don't like that attitude because we've already passed a point, but that's no reason to shoot ourselves in the head, you know? We could still save ourselves at this point. And some of these effects are reversible, too, to the extent that, like, we can take carbon out of the atmosphere, not through, like, carbon sequestration. That's always been a scam. It doesn't work. But through planting more trees, making more natural spaces, having more plants that are drawing carbon out of the atmosphere themselves, we can reverse these effects. That's possible. We can do that. We just have to do it, like, now, you know? So, yeah. Uh, we shouldn't stop trying to make things better. Exactly, Sanaton, exactly. Don't... Don't become too fatalistic about these things. You know? Think of it like hypothermia, you know? You're out in the cold, you're trying to get back to the cabin, but it's so cold. You fall down in the snow, and part of you just wants to, just wants to lay, lie down and, and go to sleep. You know, oh, that'll, it'll just be easier. I'm so cold anyway. You know, sleep is warm. But no, you'll die. You can't do that. You can't do that. That'll be the end of you. That'll be the end of us if we don't do something about this very soon. So yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, don't take a snow nap, Claire Exactly. Yeah. And Mikey, like, that's exactly what I'm talking about. 
We're decades away from working at scale, which I'm not even sure it's, it might be even longer than that for working at scale. There's like lots of people trying to make money on this kind of thing. Like, oh yeah, carbon sequestration. I promise, bro, you know, it'll work, bro. Carbon sequestration, it'll definitely work. You know, just keep pumping carbon into the atmosphere and like, and pay us to, you know, to take it out. That's the part about it that seems really scammy. We have working carbon sequestration. It's called trees. Let's save the trees. Let's plant more trees. Let's stop cutting down the trees that we have. You know? Let's maybe start with, like, not completely destroying the Amazon rainforest. That would be a good start. You know? Yeah. But trees don't get angel investment. You know, this that's the thing, Valiant Cheese. I know you're joking. But, you know, sometimes... Stockholders and capitalists are going to have to take a bit of a haircut. Sometimes more than a haircut. Sometimes they might have to be fed to crocodiles. You know? Or thrown into a volcano. You know? What's good for the goose is good for the gander, but also the guy going around slaughtering the geese, what's bad for him is good for us geese. You know? So maybe let's throw the guy killing the geese into a volcano. Not actionable. <laughs> Don't take this seriously. Uh, in a video game, in Minecraft, whatever, you know? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like we went off on a bit of a tangent with this uh, science, like reproducibility video. So let me let me put a link into the chat for you if you'd like to watch the rest of that. There you go. But uh, let's look at another snakes video here that also has to do with climate change. And uh, and then we'll get into Thursday Birds Die. How does that sound? Science Stream says that was a fun tangent. I, I hope so, Belen. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you for the... I appreciate your feedback, Belen. Yeah. Good. Um, let's get back to snakes for National Serpent. Stop, music. Stop. Here we go. Uh, a snakes. About 59 million years ago, the rainforest of Colombia was full of giants. It wasn't long after the extinction that ended the reign of the non-avian dinosaurs. And the fauna yeah. in this part of South America were already starting to get big again. In this lush, swampy ecosystem, there were huge turtles, way bigger than the largest members of their group today. And there were specialized fish eaters with long, yeah. narrow snouts crocodile relatives that were every bit as long as today's biggest saltwater crocs. But the largest animal lurking in that ancient forest, like by far, was Titanoboa, the largest- Titanoboa. A friend of mine actually worked on this critter and, uh, and helped publish it. Well, friend of mine, people call him a friend. I knew him a long time ago when I was in high school and he was a doctoral student, I think, at Berkeley. Uh, Jason Head, um, Find him. Here we go. Take a look at this. A lost world of giants, 60 million years old. Yeah. Ruled by a slithery monarch of unbelievable size. So for the last two years, the Smithsonian Institution and the Smithsonian Channel, That's Jason there. the University of Florida with the Florida Museum of Natural History, and now the Nebraska State Museum with myself, have been working on a television program about Titanoboa and about the environments that it lived in. Yeah. So when I was a volunteer at the University of California Museum of Paleontology, when I was in high school, Jason Head was, I think, a doctoral student there at the time. He was getting his PhD. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I think this is before he moved to Nebraska. Uh, so yeah, cool guy. Like, and good on him for like tolerating me at the time as a high schooler, like super enthusiastic about, I remember just like grilling him with all these questions about like, where did snakes come from? Did they evolve from Mosasaurs or from a common ancestor between Mosasaurs and another, are they varanid lizards? Blah, 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 blah. Just like peppering him with questions about this. And he was a really good sport about it. So kudos to Jason. About Titanoboa and uh, about the environments that it lived in. Sliding into the water, it is coming home. And so we have been filming in Florida, we've been filming in Canada, we've been filming in Venezuela, where we got to go down and actually hunt modern anacondas. This snake looks like he's got a diameter of about <laughs> nine, maybe 10 centimeters at the widest point, which is one fifth to one seventh the width of Titanoboa. Holy cow. What we have done with this special is to show people the, the pattern, the history of discovery, and how we came up with the, the ideas that we had about what Titanoboa means for its environment, its climate, and also how we, we make inferences about the biology of the animal, how big it got, what it ate, Look at that. how it lived. The, the, really, the important thing about the discovery of Titanoboa is not that just it's this amazingly big snake and that it's very cool that snakes get that big. It's what it tells us about the world. Yeah. Jason Head, their expert in extinct snakes, makes his first visit to Sarahone. Now, of course, we don't really have a lot of skulls for the fossil record of snakes because they're very light and they break apart after the animals die. When I was a kid looking at animals, I had no idea that I'd be in this position one day. <laughs> and they used to have a big life-size triceratops model in front of the Natural History Museum. And I used to climb around on it as a little kid and then go in the museum galleries just like this gallery and look around and be all wide-eyed. And now I'm actually having the opportunity as an adult to kind of live that dream and to be helping construct galleries like this and to provide the research that is making other little kids look around in wide-eyed. And so, you know, the, the, yeah, the greatest right. thing for me is that if there is a seven or eight-year-old who is going to watch the special and see Titanoboa and get inspired to become a paleontologist, if I can get a couple of kids to do that, then I've definitely kind of made my mark. Amen. Amen, brother. Yeah. 60 million years. Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. Here's a link to that video right there. Uh, go give it a thumbs up. It's only got six thumbs up right now. And only... Only 212 views? Holy cow. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Titanoboa. Just snake ever known. At 13 meters is about twice the size of the biggest snakes alive today. It was like seven of me long. Yeah. And me has a lot of questions about this thing. Like, why can't I have one anymore? Because it sounds really cool and I got mice in my attic. But also, where did it come from? Is it related to any living snake species? And how did it live? What did it eat? How does a snake that big actually work? But the biggest question for me <laughs> has just been about its bigness. It's swallowing a crocodile. What allowed this snake to grow to nearly twice the size of any snake we know today? Well, it seems Titanoboa was truly a product of its environment, specifically yeah. of the climate that it lived in. It's only been in the past few years that we've put together the many pieces of this puzzling creature, but it turns out that the greatest snake that the world ever saw was made possible by a warming planet. Yep. Yeah. The story of Titanoboa's discovery begins in the snake early 2000s, biggest. when a geology <laughs> student on a field trip found several <laughs> fossil leaves at a site called Cerajon, a large yeah. coal mine in Colombia near the border with Venezuela. And those fossil leaves were so fascinating that they attracted researchers who ended up leading a series of expeditions that lasted more than a decade. On those digs, scientists found a treasure trove of plant fossils, including things like early beans, bananas, and chocolate plants, relatives of the plants that still live in South America today. The fossils yeah. of Seta Home provided us with a snapshot of a world that no longer exists, the earliest recorded neotropical rainforest, dating back 58 million to 60 million years ago. And during one of these expeditions, another kind of fossil was found that raised a lot of questions. Not from a plant, but an animal. It was a strange looking vertebra, one that resembled the same bone from an anaconda, but way bigger. This yeah. single bone would turn out to be the first evidence of a truly massive snake. In Very time, cool. researchers would collect over 100 fossil remains of ribs, vertebrae, and even parts of the skull, representing 28 individual snakes of this species. And those vertebrae can tell you a lot about a snake, because if snakes have anything, it's a lot of backbone. And scientists could tell from the pattern of features on these vertebrae, like the position of certain holes and ridges, that it belonged to a member of the family known as Boidae, which includes all of the boas. 
Now, there aren't many fossils of boids older than Titanoboa, which is about 59 million years old. But based on what we know about their evolutionary relationships with other reptiles, we think that snakes evolved from a four-limbed ancestor sometime before the Middle Jurassic period, 167 million before years ago. Before the Middle Jurassic? Some of the earliest fossils that we'd call snakes based on their skulls probably still Way earlier limbs. than I would have thought. So figuring out what counts as an early snake is complicated. And in fact, living boas, as well as pythons, actually have vestigial hind limbs called spurs, evolutionary relics of this tetrapod ancestor. Yep, and let me show you that real quick. Yeah, so these pelvic spurs are found on anacondas and boas today. It's usually the males, I think, that have these, but these are the remnants of the hind limbs, the remnants of the pelvic girdle. They're toward the very end of the animal because snakes do not have long tails. They just don't. Um, most of them is body. But, uh, yeah, pelvic spurs, also known as vestigial legs, or external protrusions found around the cloaca and certain superfilmies of snakes, belonging to the greater infraorder Alethinophidia. Join us as we unravel some of the mysteries of these incredible creatures from our past, these terrible lizards. Well, 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 J. Marianne. Ah, look at that, holy cow. And the 84 readers want to hear about those terrible lizards. It's great to have you here, Jay Marianne. Thank you, thank you for the raid, and welcome, raiders. Rainstorm, Raylin, Frankenstein 913, Simmons 2714. Something about how the world was 80 million years ago, which is, which is. And uh, Mortimer Penguin. Thank you all for the follows. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. Perilous 3D and Fee Hope. Thank you also. Finding fossils. Welcome. Welcome. It is good to have you here. Yeah, holy cow. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch. Talking about fossils. Talking about natural history. Yeah, talking about... Tells us something about how the world was. 80 million years ago. And Hansk, Derek, and Mumblecat, thank you for your follows as well. Welcome, welcome. It's great to have you here. First off, J. Marianne. And serious game of paleontology. J. Marianne, how did your stream go? I hope it was really, really good, and it is great to have you here. Tell me about it. Uh, Mari Raid. Yes, indeed, J DJR Supreme. How are you doing? Howdy, howdy. Yeah. But in the serious game of paleontology, much larger mysteries still remain. Yeah. And High Def HD. It's good to see you, too. Welcome back. Like I said, my name is Danny. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I'm here on Twitch trying to do some good old-fashioned science outreach. Today happens to be National Serpent Day. Talking about snakes. Snakes are really cool animals. I know a lot of people don't like snakes, but they are absolutely worthy of our respect and admiration and our our study. We're talking about fossil snakes at the moment. We were right before you came on in here with your raid. Thank you again. Good stuff. Frankenstein says your setup is so cool. Thank you. Shoot. You know what's cooler, though, maybe, is, uh, I like to think, my backstory. So let me share that with you. Um, without further ado, since we've got a lot of cool new people here, let me call forth a good friend of ours who is sneaking up behind me right now. Hang on. Goodness. He's very eager. Previously recorded Danny is walking up behind me right now. He's going to, you know tell you a little bit about who I am, why in the world a paleontologist is here on Twitch, all that good stuff. So without further ado, we will let him take the spotlight here. I don't really like talking about myself. He's honestly much better at it than I am, partly because he has previously recorded. So, J. Marianne, thank you again for the raid, and previously recorded Danny, take it away. Well, thanks for present day, Danny. 
Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm gonna level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, fortunately he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspices of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, and fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchuncus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience with the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives and help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. <laughs> oh, give me a home Where the hadrosaurs roamed Where triceratops bellowed and grazed Where erosion uncovers Bones we seek to discover For to strike the whole world amazing It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online 
to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now, thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you. And I'm so happy to be able to do so. It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it, by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. And to everybody who's new, welcome. I'm genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. And I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and uh, I'd be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more to Jay Marianne. Can we get another shout out for Jay Marianne right there? Thank you for your raid. I really appreciate it. And DJ Projtech. DJ Project. Sorry. Thank you for your follow eight minutes ago. I think I failed to mention you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you here. We are today, of course, talking about... Dinosaur. We're not talking about dinosaurs right now. We're talking about fossil snakes. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mind, for your follow, too. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. Um, we're talking about snakes. It's National Serpent Day. Snakes get a bad rap. We're trying to fight against that a little bit right now. Uh, we are watching a video about the largest fossil snake ever found called Titanoboa. And um, here, rather than starting that video over, let's find a new video real quick to, uh, to just kind of introduce this critter to you, chat. Um... Let's try this. History's deadliest predators. From Smithsonian Channel. Hopefully this is not too sensationalistic. Anomalocaris. One of Earth's earliest marine monsters, it ruled the primordial oceans. Yeah, this is not what I was looking for. Um... What if? That looks lousy. Uh, Titanobo at the zoo. Let's try this from Smithsonian. Uh. <laughs> We're here at the Reptile Discovery Center. Well, Titanobo, if if all the estimates are correct, uh, an animal that can grow forty to fifty feet long, you can just imagine what would be on the menu then. Maybe with yeah. potential food items for Titanobo, like for school buses. That could be potentially. Helicopters. Over I'm kidding. Long, a crocodile, this animal lived like 50 uh, million years ago. Large turtles, large fish, other snakes potentially. Let's say if t today we, we actually could get a Titanoboa in our collection, we would have to find some commercially available uh, mass produced animal. I mean, they're carnivores. They need to eat, swallow their food whole. Feed them pigs See? or something. I'm, I'm thinking cows maybe. Yeah. Uh, sheep. <laughs> Yeah, uh, swallowing a cow hole would be something to see. Um, generally, I don't think we would probably, if, if we had a Titanoboa in our collection, I don't think that's something that um, most of the public would want to watch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you never know. Uh, if you're a fan of reptiles, maybe. Um, yeah, anyway, Titanoboa. Titanoboa. Cool critter. tell you a lot about a snake because if snakes have anything it's a lot of backbone and scientists yeah. could tell from the pattern they were silly ben Rick, you're right like you're the position right of certain holes and ridges that it belonged to a member of the family the Linux, boa yeah. day, which includes yeah. all of the boas 
Now, there aren't many fossils of boas older than Titanoboa, which is about 59 million years old. But based on million, what we know about their evolutionary relationships with other reptiles, we think that snakes evolved from a four-limbed ancestor sometime before the Middle we Jurassic. We were talking about this earlier. Sixty-seven million years ago. But yeah. some of the earliest fossils that we'd call snakes based on their skulls probably still had limbs. So figuring out what counts as an early snake is complicated. And in fact, living boas, as well as pythons, actually have vestigial hind limb. Oh, watch that drop there, malpractice lawsuit. <laughs> That's a different kind of lawsuit there. Anyway, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizer. Sam Neill from Jurassic Park. Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed, America loses them forever. It's true, Gremlo. Thank you for the follow as well. Welcome, welcome. Yeah. And what's the snake next to the Diablophus that looks like a frying egg? No, you mean in my background here? You mean like this fossil snake here? I'm not sure what this one is called, but it is a fossil snake. I think from the Green River Formation of Wyoming. Here, let's find out. Um, let's see. Yep, it is from the Green River. I don't know if it's been named. Has it? Whoever wrote this says, I think the snake must belong to the species Boavis eidelmanii. It's probably one of the best preserved fossil snakes in North America. It is beautiful. Yeah. Let's look that up. Boavis. I'm primarily from the Eocene Age strata of North America. Lovely. That one's not as pretty as uh, as the the one right here, you know. But yeah, what does it mean by exploded head? I mean, it just means that the skull bones are disarticulated. So this happens to a lot of critters after they die, as the different bones in the skull kind of come apart. Uh, yeah. When we say. When we say exploded skull, in the biological sciences, usually we mean, you know, that the different skull bones are disarticulated, like this pachycephalosaur here you're about to see. Yeah. So a skull is actually made up of a bunch of different bones. I think we as humans sometimes forget that because our skulls are like... Our skulls are pretty solid and blocky and, like, don't have a lot of fenestrae or windows in them. But, doesn't matter. Pachycephalosaurs are the same way, and there's a bunch of different bones that make up the skull like this. Yeah. Um, so each one of these is a different bone, and these are all... Like, there are sutures in between each of these bones where they fit together. Like that. I'll show you a... Ontogeny. A diagram of... Yeah, here we go. Where is that Dromaeosaurus skull? Oh boy. Um... Stop it. There we go. So there's a skull of Dromaeosaurus, related to Velociraptor, Deinonychus, Utahraptor, etc. And these are the different bones in the skull right there. This is not all of them. Some of them are, are hidden from view. You can't see the vomers, for instance. They're behind the maxilla and the jugal, up on the roof of the mouth. But there's a bunch of different bones that make up the skull. 
And in animals that have more loosely woven skulls, like snakes in particular, those skulls have a tendency to to fall apart after depth. They have a tendency to disarticulate after the animal dies. And the bones just all kind of get scattered like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyway. Um, so let's get back to our video on Titanoboa. It's called Spurs, evolutionary relics of this tetrapod ancestor. We don't know if Titanoboa had spurs, but given that all of its living relatives do, it's possible. But still, living boids never Probable, get anywhere near as big as Titanoboa. Based on the dimensions of its vertebrae, as well as on and the size of the living yeah. species, experts Things estimate that it reached lengths just under 13 meters. That's not as just long a book as the largest T-Rex. Now, by comparison, the longest snake around today, the reticulated python, is usually around seven meters, with some outliers stretching out as much as nine meters. Based on its wow. length, researchers have also been able to estimate the mass of Titanoboa, and it likely tipped the scales at around 1,135 kilograms, which is about the wow. same as a bull bison or an adult male giraffe. So, not exactly a lightweight. Titanoboa was not just the largest snake species ever known. It was also the largest non-marine vertebrate in its day. But this giant reptile was huh. not alone in that Colombian rainforest. As paleontologists later discovered, the Seta home formation revealed many more species of epic proportions. They unearthed a six meter long crocodile-like reptile called Acrontosuchus and a turtle, Puentemis, that had a carapace some one and a half meters across. So this left many experts wow. wondering, how exactly did all these creatures reach such monstrous sizes? Ah. Well, the first thing to note is that the Cerajon formation dates back to just a few million years after the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event that wiped out all of the non avian dinosaurs and many other megafauna. And in fact, it's like maybe 80% of all life on Earth died out when that asteroid hit. When that asteroid hit and spewed up, you know, tons of dust and soot, there were global wildfires and tsunamis and acid rain and just environmental catastrophe. We, as mammals, almost went extinct at this time. Mammals almost completely blinked out of existence. We barely made it through this. And that left an open niche for large predators. But probably the more important factor is that all of these giant animals that set a hone were reptiles. And most reptiles, yeah. of course, are cold-blooded. So their body temperatures vary depending on the ambient temperature of their environment. As a result, their metabolisms change with the temperature, too. They speed up when temps are higher and slow down in colder environments. That means that temperature has a huge effect on cold-blooded reptiles. So while you might think that metabolism is just how fast an organism burns calories, it actually includes all of the chemical processes that keep an organism Including alive. growth. And yeah. for a reptile, when it's warmer, all those chemical reactions are going faster. So it can do things like grow faster, assuming it's got enough food. So even though bigger animals typically have slower metabolisms, this effect of high temps on reptiles is so strong that it can allow a creature like Titanoboa to reach its terrific proportions. Now, how hot of a climate did this snake live in exactly? Well, the temperatures of long gone ecosystems can be estimated using fossils of reptiles like Titanoboa based on what yeah. we know about the relationship between temperature and body size in modern cold blooded animals. This method shows that Titanoboa would have needed an average temperature of about 30 to 34 degrees Celsius to survive. Now, that's really warm. That's really warm. Now, some researchers argue that this would have been so hot that the snake would actually have overheated. But other methods have been used to study the ancient climate, like analyzing marine core samples and the ratios of carbon isotopes in fossil leaves. And these methods show that the temperature was above 25 degrees Celsius and maybe as high as 31 degrees. So either way, it was warmer then than in today's average rainforest. And in a lush environment with such steamy temperatures, Titanoboa had plenty of dining options. But when paleontologists studied the skull morphology of this giant snake, they were a little surprised by what they learned about its diet. In most snakes, the teeth are firmly fused to the jaws by a bone-like tissue. But Titanoboa's teeth were only weakly attached to its jaws. It also had a lot of teeth compared to other boas. And these traits have been observed today in snakes that specialize in eating fish, like the brown water snake and the banded sea crate. These features suggest that Titanoboa was the first known fish-eating boa, living or extinct. And I guess it also means huh. it would be of no help getting those mice out of my attic. The world's biggest snake mm. thrived for a couple million years in the late Paleocene Epoch. Its giant lifestyle made possible by the extreme climate at the time. But as with all things, it was not meant to last. Titanoboa lived just a few million years before global temperatures spiked even higher in an event known as the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, which- Yeah, so this is like a period of massive global warming but 
it was fairly gradual, like, ramping up to that point. It's not like today, where it's just shooting up to the point where creatures can't adapt. This was like a gradual ramping up to the PETM, the Paleocene, Eocene, Thermal Maximum there. Which we've talked about before. Around 56 million years ago, the atmosphere contained massive amounts of carbon dioxide that raised the global temperatures by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius. And this yeah. period of global warming lasted for about 200,000 years. But after that, things cooled back down a lot. Around 49 million years ago, the climate began to cool, eventually leading to the formation of the Antarctic ice sheet. And while we don't know exactly yep. why or when Titanoboa went extinct, it probably would have needed an average temperature of 30 or 31 degrees Celsius to maintain its massive size. In the end, we're all products of our environments, shaped by the worlds we live in. In the case of Titanoboa, a freakishly hot climate created an environment that fostered the biggest snake that ever lived. But only for a couple million years, the blink of an eye in geologic time. So let it serve as a reminder that even the biggest creatures around are no match for a changing planet. There you go. Cool stuff. I'll give you a link to that. And, uh... Perilous 3D says, Are baleen teeth identifiable in the fossil record? Teeth used loosely? I think baleen is hard to fossilize, but since we have modern whales that have baleen, we can identify their ancestors pretty well, and we could say, like, oh yes, these whales would have had baleen, and these other ones wouldn't have. But I don't know if the baleen itself fossilizes well. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Again, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. I don't know a lot about fossil whales. But I am uh, hoping to bring on a bunch of other paleontologists as guests on this channel pretty much every week. That's the goal. For the rest of this year, except when I'm in the field, which will be for a solid two or three, maybe four months. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, so maybe we can bring on a whale scientist. Maybe somebody like Bobby Bozenacker, for instance. Uh, I gotta talk to Bobby. Uh, an old colleague of mine. But yeah, yeah. Uh, with that having been said, happy National Serpent Day, everybody. I hope you had fun talking about snakes. Hope you've got a better appreciation for our serpent neighbors. But today is also Thursday Birds Day. And so without further ado, we are going to jump into... Thursday Birds Day here. So let's go ahead and go for it. Thursday Birds Day starts right now. Oh, hold on, something's coming. Something's coming out of here. Look, there's a bird, dude. It knows what's good. I'm telling you, I just heard it inside. <laughs> Thursday Birds Day. Birds are all around us in everyday life. But most of the time we hardly even notice them. Thursday Birds Day is a step toward correcting this oversight. Do you want to be part of Thursday Birds Day? I don't know. Here's how you can contribute. Go outside during the week and pay special attention to the birds around you. See if you can take a picture of a bird. It doesn't have to be a good picture, any old photo will do. Upload the picture to the Discord, and we will discuss it on Thursday. Simple as that. Thursday Birds Day is an invitation to go outside and appreciate the grandeur of the natural world. It's a reminder that, since birds are theropods, dinosaurs still enrich our daily lives. It's great! And finally, it's a celebration of the amazing history of life on our planet. 
सो हैप्पी थर्सडे बर्थडे Well, 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 everybody! Happy Thursday, birthday to you! And let's get into it, shall we? Um, I'm gonna try and do this relatively quickly today because, well, it's late already. Cheeseness, aka Valiant Cheese, it's got our first Thursday, first Thursday birthday birds. Yeah. For next week's Thursday birthday, on the weekend I saw an unusual sight: a pair of sulfur-crested kookaburras harassing a swamp harrier. It was mostly happening behind a hill, and I didn't get any good shots, but it was interesting to watch. And that is very cool. Very cool, Valiant Cheese. Look at that. Is that a kookaburra? Wait, hang on. A pair of sulfur crested. Oh, cockatoos harassing a swamp harrier. Oh, nice. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Makes a lot more sense. Very nice there, cheese. Very very nice. A swamp harrier. I, I'm familiar with harrier harriers, both the jump jet and the bird. But I'm not familiar with swamp harriers. Uh, yeah, was it? let's take a look. There's a swamp area right there. Look at those long legs. Those long leggy legs. Impressive. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Very neat. Well, thank you there, Valiant Cheese. I appreciate that. These two broke away from the flock to chase the bird of prey for what felt like 20 minutes. Yeah, a lot of birds will do that. They'll exhibit what we call mobbing behavior. Uh, no, that doesn't mean engaging in organized crime. It means, uh, like... Maybe smaller birds harassing a large bird of prey. Um. Here, let's. Hi, let's... I'm Kevin McGowan. Birds are fascinating to watch. They do so many things. They're always moving, flying, hopping, swimming, singing, or interacting. They're often climbing, probing, picking, eating, displaying, or doing something that draws our attention. Sometimes a bird's <laughs> behavior is easily understood. A heron catching a fish or a parrot eating fruit, that's obviously about getting food. But sometimes it's not easy to tell just what a bird is doing. They can yeah. make some odd displays and do some crazy things. Are they fighting, courting, defending a territory, trying to attract a mate, or are they using some odd method to find food? The first step in learning to understand bird behavior is to get a sense of the range of things that birds do and get a handle on what preoccupies them. But don't yep. stop there. The real fun comes in seeing it all from a bird's point of view and going beyond to explore why birds are doing what they're doing and uncover the forces that shape their decisions and actions. Understanding behavior from a bird-centered view unlocks all sorts of new insights. Insights that will make your encounters with birds even richer. Yeah, one of those behaviors that they do is mobbing behavior. Uh, a really cool video here from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but uh, mobbing a barred owl. So here's a barred owl here, just minding its own business, being an owl. But owls are predatory birds, and they're large, and other birds don't necessarily like that. And, uh, are we gonna see some mobbing behavior? Yeah, there you go. Just, just kind of buzzing this owl. Oh, man. They say, go away, owl. And they did. Anyway, good stuff. Rally and Cheese, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Lordy says, you don't have to go over all the birds I sent in. I was just excited. Oh, Lordy. Oh, boy. What kind of cool birds are we going to see here? Let's see, let's see. Lady Fiend has got a wholesome memes bird meme. 
just been for a walk, and there was a man playing the violin for an audience of two ducks. And I doubt I'll ever see something so pure and beautiful again in my life. That is beautiful. I like that. I like that. Thank you, Lady Fiend. And May Mayor of Space? Roseate Spoonbill shot from my kayak. Uh-oh. I hope you mean with a camera, Mayor of Space. Very cool. Look at this. See, when I was talking about how Florida has some of the coolest animals in, in North America, this is what I'm talking about. Do we get roseate spoonbills in any other U.S. state? I kind of doubt we do. Yeah. You wonder why they're called spoonbills? Yeah. That's super cool, Mayor Space. That's super cool. We don't have these birds where I live. That's super neat. That is super neat. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor Space. Lordy says, went to Puerto Vallarta Botanical Gardens, and I saw so many birds! Any bird nerds in here know who these fellas are? Who is this? I don't know who that is. Look at that long bill. It almost reminds me of, like, an Oriole, but the, the beak is so long. Since they're eating those fruits? Who is that? I don't know who that is. We've got some kind of woodpecker here. I like how the bees have also figured out the bird feeder, <laughs> the hummingbird feeder. And is this is this woodpecker after the the nectar or is it after the bees? I don't even know. Yeah. We've got this very green bird right here. I don't know who this is, but they are beautiful. After the nectar, in this case. Gotcha, Lordy. Okay, cool. I've never seen a woodpecker visit a hummingbird feeder. That is... That's cool behavior. And we've got... A blackbird or somebody right there? I don't know who this is. It's very cool, Lordy. It's very cool. Yeah. Um, he was blue and black. Nice. Very cool, Lordy. Very cool. Thank you for sharing. I want to actually investigate these later when I'm not so pressed for time. Figure out who those birds are. Yeah. Now, Lordy and Ios visited Mexico last week while I stayed here and streamed. Gorgeous, gargantuans, and authentic. Heptacular raptor. So long ago, their fossil bones remain, so we know just what they were like and can even sculpt them into still or rather extinct life. Heptacular Raptor, thank you for the 17 here. months. Thanks all. I'm glad you're always learning new things here. I am too, honestly. That's what paleontologizing is all about. Thank you for helping me continue to do this, Heptacular Raptor, with your continued support. It means a lot to me. It really does. Thank you. Alexander Morrison, oh boy, has got a great egret. That is a great egret there. Look at that. It's great. Striding through a shallow ditch. This guy was walking alongside me for a few minutes during my morning mile-long walk. No music this time. Only cars breezing by. And I'll provide my own music. Look at that. A great egret. Beautiful. Beautiful bird there. Really lovely. Thank you, Alexander Morrison. Man, the necks of herons are so cool and weird. Their trachea actually, like, switches sides. It goes from under the vertebrae to over the vertebrae at the back of the neck. It, like, their trachea is, like, wrapped around their vertebral... It's so weird. They're bizarre and awesome. And thank you for sharing, Alexander Morrison. Thank you for sharing. Uh, uh, that is a really nice video with the reflection there. Stellar. Uh, Lenina has got a very vocal crow on my massive Texas live oak tree. There's always something in this tree. That's what oaks are all about, you know? That's lovely. Corvus Branchyrhynchos. 
the American Crow. Very nice, Lenina. Thank you for posting. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Thank you for the tracheal nightmares. Anytime, Sparky Pugwash. And a Fellini Fiend. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? I did play Metazoo today, Purple Herbal. Yeah. Yeah. Tree is likely over 60 years old. It's massive. That's awesome. Oak trees like this are centers for biodiversity. There are so many different creatures that use oak trees for shelter and for food. Oak trees are super important. Yeah. Good stuff. And not the brain. Since you might wonder why sheep are included if you look up. I inadvertently captured a dino in flight. And we've got some Gallus Gallus here. Some gallant Gallus Gallus. Chickens. And some dunks. <laughs> uh, look at them. Very nice. Very nice. Love me some chickens. They're wonderful, wonderful animals. And yeah, we've got a... That looks like Columba Live. A rock dove, a.k.a. feral pigeon. Flying over those sheeps. Very nice. Good stuff, Not the Brain. Thank you, thank you for sharing. Yeah. And Doctor Who? I'm not sure, Claire Burr. I don't know. Yeah. Tarcone says, in honor of hearing the first Robin song of the year from earlier today, and subsequently the first angry Robin call, both from the same Robin, I decided to post this pic I got last year. Very cool, Charcon. Very cool. I have an ukulele song about Robins that I should really finish putting together. So it'd be nice to be able to play that. Yeah, angry Robin. Looks angry here, too. Maybe we're anthropomorphizing, but... Very nice, Charcone. Very, very nice. Good stuff. Uh, and Janine says, I'm pretty sure these are... These two are Port Lincoln parrots. They seem to be enjoying my... Frangipani tree. Out front of my house. I couldn't get a great shot, and unfortunately my road is in the process of being replaced. And the sound is quite loud. Well, let's listen up. That's not loud. Maybe this one is. It's a beautiful tree and some beautiful birds. Look at them. Very, very cool. Very, very cool. Thank you, Janine's Mess. Port Lincoln Parrots. You know what? Let's look them up on our tree of life here. You saw an albino robin one time. That's wild, Retro Crisis, really? Cool, cool, cool. Port Lincoln Parrot. AKA Ringneck Parrot. Wow. Was that Plumeria? Really, Ungoy? Cool. And hello, sweetie pie. Well, how are you doing? Burp. Wow, we're having a visit from uh, from one of the landlords today. Hello, sweetie pie. How are you doing? Can I can I get you some treats? Can I get you some treats, sweetie pie? Yeah. Oh, give me that sound. Well, well, well. Okay. You know, cats are gonna cat. Hey. You can come up here if you want it. Oh, 
Does that smell good? Well, let's see if she figures it out. Oh, and she did. Good for you, sweetie pie. to go. Good for you. Ladies and gentlemen, sweetie pie. Yeah. Um, not the most photo, uh, photogenic? She's very photogenic, but she's not always, she's a little camera shy sometimes, sweetie pie is. So yeah, yeah. Charcon says, how long has Danny had a cat? I don't have a cat, Charcon. There are three cats who live here, and they have me. They were here first. They're my landlords, Charcon. Yeah. Uh, the cat has a tenant. There you go. Yeah. No, I moved I moved here in, uh, in like, beginning of December. These cats have been here for several years now. Spoken like a true cat person. I'm honestly more of a dinosaur person, Perilous 3D, but, uh... You know. When the time comes to bow to my feline overlords... I know what to do. Anyway, Ringneck Parrot. Very cool. Barnadius Zonarius. Does that look like these critters here? It does. Port Lincoln Parrot, a.k.a. Ringneck Parrot. Very cool. Thank you, thank you, Janine, for that uh, that post there. It's excellent. Good stuff. And we haven't had we haven't had mini pie yet, Golganek. We'll see if she shows up. But yeah. Axeman's got a Carolina chickadee I found in my backyard this week. During colder nights, they can be intentionally... They can intentionally induce a type of hypothermia to conserve energy. Yeah, chickadees are so cool. I know black-capped chickadees do that. I didn't know Carolina chickadees could, too. Thankfully, with milder temperatures recently, they have been very lively. And what a beautiful bird right there. Look at that. What a wonderful photo. That's beautiful. Really nice. Chickadees. Wonderful. Um, thank you, thank you, Axeman, for posting. That is lovely. It really is. Yeah, so round. They can become very round, Emily. Yeah. Uh, Daisy McGar has got a friend in Kingston, Washington, captured this image of a kingfisher. This looks like a belted kingfisher to me. So it was okay to share that. It's lovely. The, holy cow. What a majestic animal. Just... <sighs> Kingfishers are hard to photograph. Thank you, Daisy McGar. That's really neat. That's really neat. Yeah. I've never captured a picture of a kingfisher in flight. This is really good. This is really good. I think this is a belted kingfisher. Um, yeah, which is related to the kookaburras, like we were talking about earlier, or like we mentioned earlier. Kookaburras are the world's largest kingfisher, but here in Western North America, we've got belted kingfishers like this. Megasaurile Alcyon. Very cool. Uh, 
These guys frustrate you to no one. I know, they always fly away as soon as you bring your camera up to, to photograph the mayor's face. Oh, man. I've only ever managed to get pictures of one individual kingfisher, and that one just hangs out on fences as people walk past. It's very used to people. Most kingfishers are very skittish. Yeah. Green Herring says the belted kingfisher is the only kingfisher in most of the U.S., yeah. Cool. Cool. They're they're super cool critters. Anyway, thank you there, Daisy, for sharing that with us. Lovely photo that your friend got. Really nice. Really nice. Now, Green Herring... Oh, man, has got a Merlin for us. Oh, this is great. This Merlin is a regular at my local park. Merlins are a type of falcon, in between peregrines and kestrels, size-wise. They are adorable little fluffball, cutie pies, and vicious killers of sparrows. Yes. More than once I've realized that there was one in a tree above me because of the feathers falling from the sky. Note the second photo includes predation, but I made sure to choose a shot where the prey is hidden by a branch so you can't see anything gross. That is lovely. Take a look at this Merlin. Beautiful, beautiful photo there. Holy cow, Green Herring. You've outdone yourself again. Look at this majestic bird of prey. Man, if these were like three times larger, they'd probably be flying off neighborhood children to eat them on top of telephone poles and stuff. You know? Lovely. You know, much like you see here. Um... in browser. There we go. Look at those feathers flying. Yeah. Good stuff. They're very skilled hunters. They are. I remember one time I was walking, actually in this neighborhood. I was walking through here and uh, I just saw this like quick flash of, uh, of brown and then I heard like a cheep cheep, and then the cheep cheep stopped. It was a Merlin that had caught, I think probably a house sparrow. And it's just busily you know, eating it in, front, in somebody's front yard in a tree. Um, yeah, yeah. And it was so cool that it like, it, it clearly caught the sparrow like in level flight. It didn't dive down like a peregrine. It just went whoosh, horizontally. Grabbed it. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool, Green Herring. Pretty cool. Sparrows seem to be the preferred prey. That makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I'm lucky to have some Merlins in my neighborhood. Um, They're really neat. They're really neat. Let's look them up on the Tree of Life. We'll jump from Kingfishers to... The Merlin. Falco Columbiaranus? What are they? There you go. Columbiaris. Maryland. You think they could have gotten a better photo, you know? These are taken from Wikipedia. Um, your photo is so much better here, Green Herring. Consider uploading this to Wikipedia. <laughs> it seems like they could use it. <laughs> Yeah, they could use my photo if they wanted. Consider it, you know? Um. Yeah. No, not the mythical figure probably featured in The Legend of King Arthur. Not that nonsense fictional stuff. Let's talk about the bird. Okay, they've got a pretty good Merlin photo there. Still not as good as yours, Green Herring, but pretty good. Pretty good. Anyway, thanks for sharing. Always a joy, Green Herring. I always look forward to seeing what you've brought to us every Thursday birthday, so... Thank you.
Bet Medler's got some action ducks for us. Action ducks! Water frenzy! And look at them! Ooh, ice on the pond. Here, let's, uh, let's unmute. Can we hear? No, well, they're not too loud. See, that's the thing. Thursday Birds Day birds don't have to be the most exotic of birds. They don't have to be anything super out of the ordinary. They could just be some ducks that you encounter as you're out walking around. But these ones are in a... Yeah. Yeah, they're in a dizzy. It's cool to see you, Bet Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. Uh, mine are often grackles. You know, grackles are birds. They count. They are still dinosaurs, Lenina. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're just one of those lunch pail birds, you know? Grackles are one of those birds where, you know, maybe they're not the flashiest of performers, but, you know, they just come back day in, day out. You know, they... they use their beaks and their feathers and they, you know, they do their bird thing. But you know what? They show up. That's all you need for Thursday Bird's Day. Yeah. <laughs> and nothing more variant says, one day ducks and geese will rise up. I, for one, will support them as they take over. Yeah. Yeah. You will, you will toil in the the bread mines for the ducks and geese. Hail our new Galliform overlords. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Good stuff. And I don't like them eating the sparrows. SV Harkin, lucky for you, ducks don't really eat sparrows. Did you realize that Chickens were a lot like little dinosaurs with feathers. I didn't, until I read a book called The Dinosaur Chicken Conspiracy. But apparently the poultry farmers don't want us to know anything about it, so they've hushed it up. It's true, Basil. Thank you for the 13 months of support. And, uh, is it a conspiracy? Chickens are a lot like little dinosaurs with feathers. In fact, a lot of dinosaurs did have feathers. In fact... Birds are living dinosaurs. You take this information and you do with it, with it what you will. But you didn't hear it from me. Okay? No, I'm just kidding. You did. Of course. Birds are living dinosaurs. That's not a secret. But yeah. Um. Anyway. Ducks like peas, but the peas don't make them sick like bread does. That's true, Bayer Space. I, I gave this advice to Snail Chaser when he was getting really into feeding ducks. He's like, Danny, what's a, what's a ducks like to eat? And I said, get those ducks some peas. They love peas. It's good for them. Nutritious. Man, they love it. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't smoke whale 6 too. <laughs> do geese like peas? They probably do, SV Harkin. We can test that hypothesis. Let's see. Geese eating peas. Can we find photographic evidence of this? Here's ducks eating peas. Oh man, look how much they like that. Oh, they love it, they love it, they love it. But do geese eat peas? I bet you they do. They're also anseriform birds. Galliform birds. They're anseriform? I think they're anseriform birds. Um, yeah, ducks eating peas. 
geese. I bet you geese would eat peas if you fed them to them. Geese would probably eat... Well, I don't know. How Do, do geese really like to eat food from people? I know ducks like it a lot. Anyway, if you uh, if you want to see more of this, here's a link. Yeah, geese will eat corn, says Marielle. Interesting. Yeah. Oh man, that's like their favorite thing. Ducks love peas. Do geese like things? They mostly just attack. I know geese have a reputation for being deadly animals that will, you know, they will attack a military convoy and just leave bleached skeletons of well-armed soldiers there. out on the killing fields, but, um, you know, geese, they're, they're not that mean, you know? Perilous says this is real and true. I mean, sure, you know, it may be true that, you know, Napoleon's advancing army Moving across Russia was almost entirely devoured by geese. But, you know, that was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> I'm making all this up. I, I know I have to caution, like, I have, I have to make disclaimers because... Well, it might be very clear to me that I'm making a joke. Not everybody in chat will realize that. I'm joking. You know... Yeah. Anyway. Aussies and emus? Well, that's another story, Kodali. We'll get to that another time. Right now, we gotta get through this. Um, cause shoot, I've gotta go eat dinner at some point. Lady Fiend has got for us... Look at that. Some kind of satacaform bird building a beautiful structure there. Birds are actually some of the great the world's great architects, believe it or not. Whether they're bower birds or whether they're little parrots or parakeets like this. That's lovely. Thank you, Lady V, for posting. Lovely. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, Afro Bennett Girl says, just about as big as the lamp. Is this a crow or is this a raven? It looks like a crow. But let's see. Oh, could be a raven. Could be a raven. That's got a like a kind of a big bill there. No, I think that's a raven. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, sharper than that, Bill. Good stuff. Very nice, Afro Bandit Girl. Very nice. Ravens are large. They are large. There is a there's a thing I saw on Twitter the other day where um somebody was talking about the difference between crows and ravens, and they're like if you have to wonder if it's a crow or a raven, it's a crow. If you have to fear for your safety, it's a raven. Um, yeah. Ravens do get big. They get big. Nova Silence says, saw a pair of pheasant cow kills. Centropus uh, fascianinus. On the fence, they sprint around the ground more than flying, so they remind me of the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park 2 running through the long grass. Well, look at this. Oh, 
I love this bird. I've never seen this before. Who are you? Oh, how cool is that? How cool is that? Holy moly. Yeah, look at this lovely bird here. Look at that fierce looking eye. Oh, man. Look at that. This looks like a bird that... You need to command its respect. Or maybe it... Maybe... No, this bird itself just commands respect. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Lovely. And this is a... Pheasant? Cow cow. I'm not really familiar with them. Where are they from? Let's look them up on the Tree of Life. I'm from Merlin too. This critter here. This is it. This is the horizon which marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Below this level, and out in here, there are dinosaur fossils. Above this level, on these rocks, there are no dinosaur fossils. So I'm actually standing on the level that marks the extinction of the dinosaurs. Melissa in denial. Island, their nine raiders have stumbled below that level. Let's talk dinosaurs. Thank you for the raid, Melissa. I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you. How was your stream? I hope it was really good. Normally, I raid you, but... Anyway, if anybody here is not yet following Melissa in denial, if you're interested in archaeology or Egyptology in particular... Melissa's both an archaeologist and an Egyptologist. Go follow her if you'd like to uh, actually be able to talk to a real-life Egyptologist here on Twitch. She's planning a trip to Egypt soon. Oh, and Melissa, there's a new uh, PBS Nova documentary. just came out, like, today. Uh, there we go. It's just a light. Here, I'll give you the link, but it's about fossil whales in Egypt from Wadi Al Hitan. Check it out. Lands of the Egyptian desert, experts are uncovering clues to a lost past. Yeah. Uh, right here. Twenty-one days. Very cool, Melissa. Very cool. Before the pharaohs, when this place was underwater, and whales. Had legs? Yeah, the very cool. The limb of this beast is just like T Rex hand. Do nothing. <laughs> Vestigial. Whales are the world's biggest mammals. Yeah. But how did they end up in the ocean? This is so awesome. They're doing everything mammals do, but in the water. Uh, now, new discoveries Valley of the Kings or Valley of the Queens. There you go, Melissa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow! Look at this. Oh my! I have not watched this yet, but I have colleagues who are going to show up in this video, and I'll be like, "Oh yeah, I know." There's Phil Gingrich. Yeah. Predators to the largest animal that has ever lived. How did the whale's journey begin? Very cool. It's one of the greatest stories of evolution. When whales could walk. Very right cool. On Nova. Good stuff. Again, here is the link right there. If we have time, we might watch this on stream next week. We'll we'll see. I've got a lot of other stuff going on. But uh, anyway, Melissa, it is good to have you back here. And we are... We're not really talking about fossil whales right now. We're doing Thursday Birds Day. Uh, and Salamander says, that fossil there is staged, right? No, that's that's how it was. That's how it died. That's how it's been for 50 million years. Yeah. And you can't get the video, maybe a, a country thing? Yeah, it might be a US thing. If you have a VPN, you could probably access it. Anyway, Melissa, thank you again for the raid. I appreciate it. How are you doing? I'm so excited for you to be able to go to Egypt again. It's super, super cool. 
Um, and I did know that birds are also found in Egypt. Yeah, Mayor of Space. In fact, actually, Melissa, we were just talking about this the other day. Um, let's see. Where did that go? Um... Let's see, this might do it. We were talking about this on, what, Tuesday, I think? Um, yeah, we've got a new dinosaur just described from South Dakota. And it also has an oblique reference to, uh, to ancient Egypt here. This is it. Okay. Paleontologists discover a new species of Ovaraptorosaur in South Dakota. The name that they gave it was Eo Neofron. This ties in with Thursday Birds Day as well. Eo Neofron Infernalis has implications for the ecology and diversity of Canignathans in the late Cretaceous period. Eo Neofron means Dawn Egyptian Vulture. It's named after the uh, the genus of Egyptian vultures, right here. Yeah. Oh, in Egypt for the first time. Oh, that's so exciting, Melissa. That's so exciting. Yeah, this new dinosaur uh, takes its name from the Egyptian vulture. Neofron is the genus name for the Egyptian vulture. This one's called Eo Neofron, so Dawn Vulture. Uh, where was the little explanation of the name? Uh, let's see here. Well, I guess maybe we have to look at the actual paper. So that's it right here in the journal PLOS One. Come on now, computer. You can do it. There we go. Let's look at etymology here. Apparently Egyptian vultures are also sometimes referred to as Pharaoh's chickens. Is that a thing that you're familiar with, Melissa? Etymology. So, uh, genus name, Eo Neofron, is derived from the ancient Greek Eo, meaning dawn, meaning dawn, and from the genus name of the Egyptian vulture, Neofron, sometimes referred to as the Pharaoh's chicken. The species name, Infernalis, derives from the Latin for hell, in reference to the Hell Creek formation where it was found. Together, the taxon name equates to Pharaoh's Dawn Chicken from Hell. What a great name. Yeah. So I don't know if that is a thing or if it's not, but uh, if you've never heard of it, maybe it's not, Melissa. But I'll, I'll give you a link to the paper here in case you're curious. Cool stuff. They didn't have chickens, lol, so I guess it would be a vulture or a duck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Let's get back to Thursday Birds Day here, to these viewer-submitted photos of birds. Nova Silence is really lo lovely. Centropus phasianinus. Pheasant. Cow cow. Let's find them on our Tree of Life. Yeah. Mayor Spaces, how many animals which are not chickens have chicken-based nicknames? More than none, for sure. Probably more than a few. Pheasant, 
Now, Cal, what are these guys related to? What are... And how do we say that name? Cow Cal? Kukul? Like, more than 20 species of them. What's up with this group of birds? I'm not familiar with them. There's one right there in Townsville, Australia. The most generic name you could come up with for a settlement. Townsville? That can't be real. They do sound cool. Oh, very nice. You think it's cuckoo? That's a type of cuckoo. Is that right? I love their eyes. They remind me of a Hwatsun with their big red eyes. And Beard says Danny pronounces the Greek and Latin names easier than the English names. Well, I am a paleontologist, you know? Those are easier to sound out than English is just weird. You know? Yeah, they're the only non-parasitic cuckoo. Interesting. Really interesting. Um, what a neat group of birds. Here. About 30 species of birds in the cuckoo family. Yeah. Very cool. There's a lot of them. Goodness gracious. Very cool. Very cool. Well, thank you very much, Nova Silence, for posting another very interesting and unusual Australian bird. I'm sure it's not unusual where you live, but man, is it cool to see. Or somebody like me. I appreciate that, Nova Silence. Very, very cool. Uh, and Heptacularaptor has got a photo of a barred owl preening in the Florida Everglades. Everglades. Very nice. Gotta clean those legs. Keep them clean. Very cool. What a great shot, Heptacular Raptor. What a great shot. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Very cool. Dr. Terra's got a ladder-backed woodpecker. And a bird I can't recognize. Super small. Some had what it looked like a yellow underside. Northeast Texas. Ooh. I love a mystery bird on Thursday Bird's Day. Good stuff. Oh, there's our woodpecker there. Nice. I don't know who the other fellow is. Birds abound there. It's a popular tree. This place is hopping. Good stuff. Very nice there. Dr. Tara. Appreciate that. This is behind a McDonald's parking lot. <laughs> uh, what is a tiny bird? I don't know. That might be what birders call an LBB. A little brown bird. Very nice. Very nice, Dr. Terra. Thanks for posting. Good stuff. Murph says, Lunch Rush. Old photos from Texas I dug up recently. Look at these. These are probably grackles, aren't they? Yeah, they love to congregate in big flocks, flocks like this. Well, they've got long tails, and they're all facing the same direction. Is that a grackle thing? This is... I don't know who the... It's a... Yeah. Their flocks are super... Oh, they are grackles. Okay, Lenina, cool. I'm impressed that they all face the same direction like this, like turns or something on the beach. Into the wind, perhaps? I don't know. Sculpin. 
They like to do this in the winter. Interesting, Cass. Okay, okay. Very nice. Very nice, Murph. Thank you, thank you. Good stuff. Yeah. And those might be boat-tailed grackles. Let's look up boat-tailed grackles real quick on the Tree of Life. Boat-tailed grackle. Yeah. I need to get better at my, uh, my bird clades. We're getting better and better at mammals through Metazoa, because so many of those darn animals are mammals. But, uh... Yeah, boat-tailed grackle. Very nice. That's a that's a lovely photo there. Anyway, good stuff, Murph. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and, uh... Tuckahue! Emily on Twitch. Nice. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Emily. This osprey, oh boy, I love ospreys, was eyeballing me the whole time I walked past the pole. Pretty sure he thought I was going to come up there and take his fish. Well, I see a tail right there of a fish. Yeah, very nice. And there's a fish of a fish. It's just a whole fish right there. <laughs> Oh, the eyes are so big. <laughs> oh, man. Look at those eyes. Just... Look at those eyes. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can... It maybe makes sense how these birds can can spot a fish under the surface of the water from maybe hundreds of feet in the air. It's impressive, you know? But it makes perfect sense. Look at the size of those peepers. Yeah, very nice, Emily. Very, very nice. Thank you for sharing. That brought me joy. I like that. Uh... And Salamander says, testing just how bad of pictures are valid submissions, I guess. Oh, man. These are fine. Couldn't get any closer before the little guy hopped away, but I'm curious what he is, if anyone can ID him. Very pointy little beak. Oh, boy. Look at that little borb. Yeah. Some kind of wren, perhaps? This is, like, at the very you know, limit of my bird knowledge, but I I look, see this and I think Wren. Oh, people in chat agree. Good, good, good. Okay. Car Carolina Wren, says Emily. Mary L. Sculpin. Okay, okay. Definitely Renny and Borbular. I like the technical terms there, Golgan. <laughs> it's super skittish, Lydia. Nice. Yeah. Carolina Wren. That would make some sense. That would make some sense. Good stuff. Uh, Miss Creation. So they recently, post recently posted a male Australian King Parrot. This is a female. She was very difficult to get a good photo of. Due, due to hiding out in the tree. Look at her. She's very pretty. And it's very clear that she is very much aware you're taking a picture of her. She's like, hmm? hmm? I see you. I see you down there. You're looking at me. I'm looking at you, too. That's lovely. <laughs> to make eye contact with a bird through a, through a camera viewfinder, that's a special thing. Yeah, very nice, Miss Creation. Very nice. Thanks for the Gorgeous. Oh, and we can zoom it even further. There we go. <laughs> yeah, she is very much aware that you're right there. 
birds are one of those like it, it could be really special watching birds because sometimes when you're watching birds they're also watching you it's a two-way street there you go out bird watching and as a matter of course they're human watching too yeah very cool well, thank you, thank you, Miss Creation. I uh, I appreciate that. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Neil has got a whoa reddish egret. What in the world is this? I keep waiting for it to do its dance, trying to spook up prey, but alas, not today. Neil, that's so cool. I've never seen a heron like this. I mean, like I've seen them in pictures and on the internet, but like never in in real life or even in a zoo. A reddish heron lives up to its name there. Very cool. Very cool. Reddish egret, says Green Herring. Okay, okay. Here, let's look them up. Reddish egret. Yeah, Egretta rufuscans. Yeah. There we go. Good stuff. That's not a good photo, but good stuff. Now, are... Are egrets and herons actually separate? Like, are those different clades? Or egrets a type of heron? I'm still not totally sure about it. So, whistling heron... These are scientific name Egretta. Is Egretta a genus? And then it is a genus, but like, are all egrets in genus Egretta? Heron, bittern. Egret, no. We've got other egrets, like cattle egrets, that are not in genus Egrettus. Okay. Huh. They're the same, really, says Green Herring. Okay, so it's arbitrary who gets called an egret and who gets called a heron. It's not like egrets are all in genus Egretta. That makes sense. Um, very cool. Thank you for posting there, Neil. Really neat. Really neat. Uh oh, and my earbud is telling me I should wrap things up soon. It's about to die. Um, but yeah, yeah. Good <laughs> luck. That's good stuff. And the neighborhood wild turkeys. This is their gobbler. Nothing more variant. Nothing more. This is... Look at this. Look at this Tom here. Look at his big red eye. Oh, man. We talk all about turkeys. We do a lot of talking turkey in November. This is a lovely photo here. Thank you for posting there. Nothing more. Thank you for posting. Oh, and that's our last one, I guess. Shoot. Well, let me show you my Thursday Birds Day bird photos from this week. I do not know what kind of ducks these are, but they are ducks indeed. I think these are winter migrants to the San Francisco Bay Area. So I made sure to photograph them while the photographing was good. I don't think they're pintails. Uh, I don't think they're scalps. They're widgets? Green herring? Widgets? I never would have gotten that. Oh. American widgeon? Really? With that red streak over the eye? Or red, green. Oh, goodness. I've been streaming too long, everybody. Forgetting my uh, the names of my colors. But yeah, it's hard to see her, but that must actually be... Green, or maybe green is only during the breeding season or something. But yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Widgeon. Let's look at them on the Tree of Life. No, American Widgeon. Yeah. Nice. Anas, that's the duck genus. Americana. Very cool. 
Now this, of course, is uh, is in San Francisco Bay. I made a visit to Alameda Island earlier this week. Uh, you know, this isn't quite low tide, but close enough. There is San Francisco off in the distance there. There's South San Francisco, San Francisco International Airport, right over there. And this is just a haven for birds, especially in wintertime. All these migratory bird species, um, they make a detour here and they, they just hang out. It's a good place for them. There's a bird refuge right here, and they, they clearly love it there. So yeah, good stuff. And moon sighting, yeah, yes indeed, Golganek. There is the Earth's moon. Um, not actual size. Yeah, good stuff. Anyway, happy Thursday Birds Day, everybody. And happy National Serpent Day. Hope you've had a good one. Tomorrow's Groundhog Day. We'll be talking about rodents and groundhogs for Groundhog Day. But until then, it's time to wrap things up for today. So let's do it. And let's see who else is doing something sciencey or maybe birdie here on Twitch. Let's see here. Hoot House livestream is live. Let's go see some owls. The birding is not ending here, it's just beginning. Good stuff. Thank you to everybody who is currently being named in our credits. All of you. Subscribers and resubscribers, followers, raiders, moderators, cheerers, and gifters. And even you, quiet lurkers and vociferous chatters. I appreciate you very much. Thank you for making this another wonderful stream. And Malpractice Lawsuit says, Bye, this was a super fun stream. I hope you'll come back tomorrow. We've got another special topic tomorrow. Rodents. Extinct and extant. If you want to hear about rodents the size of bears that used to live in the Caribbean, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Join us for that. For some more fossil science goodness. Um, thank you, thank you, everybody another wonderful stream. I hope you had a good time today. I hope you learned something. I hope you've got a, a renewed appreciation for the natural world around us. I hope you'll join me tomorrow. But for now, let's go check out some owls. And I will see you there, everybody. Take care.